G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Best Fiends a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So guys, if you've listened to the show for a while, then you know that I'm a fan of Best Fiends. In my humble but correct opinion, it's the best match 3 style game by far, and the rest are basically the same game with different colour schemes. With Best Fiends, you play through an actual storyline which helps with that satisfying feeling of progression. It's also an excellent brain-boosting puzzle game that is great for downtime. Best Fiends is now my go-to game at night too when I'm chilling in bed and I can't sleep. In fact, some mornings I even catch myself getting up a little earlier than normal just to get in a few levels before the day begins. It is genuinely difficult to pull myself away from it sometimes. And not to brag, but I'm a little over a thousand levels now and I still can't put the game down. In fact, 30 minutes can feel a lot like 30 seconds with just how much fun I'm having. I also love that I can literally play it anywhere that I want without having to worry about using data or finding Wi-Fi. So even when I don't have the internet for whatever reason, I still have a fresh challenge waiting for me to give me that mental pick-me-up that I might need. You should give it a try and let me know if you like it as much as I do. So, download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. So our house was built back in 99, about a year or so before I was born. I've had a few odd experiences in my life too, but the scariest and the craziest was when I was 10 or 11 years old. So my brother's ex-girlfriend and I, we were hanging out in one of the back rooms, now our current roommate's room, watching a movie late one night. My parents and brothers, they weren't home when this happened, but since my parents were out on a date at the time I think. But we were watching a comedy, so I know that this wasn't just my imagination playing tricks on me. And halfway through the movie, she ended up pausing it. She asked, Hey, did, did you hear that? I said, Uh, no. What? She shook her head and we continued watching the movie. About five minutes later, she stopped it again with a confused look. She asked again, Are your parents home yet? I said, um, no, they went out on a date not that long ago, so they shouldn't be back yet. After the third time of hearing something, she paused the movie. I got up and opened the door to our hallway, and there, I saw what I can only describe as an orb of light move quickly out of the hallway. What the? I exclaimed, walking towards the kitchen where it darted to. Now, our hallway is straight, with my room completely opposite of the room that we were in, on the other side. There's also a middle bedroom on the right, and just after that, her bedroom. The entrance to the kitchen is on the left side, but you can actually see it if you're in the hallway. And so, when I saw the orb dart out of the hallway, I didn't see it after that, since I saw it for a brief second. We both walked out towards the kitchen, though, and... The cupboards that held our pots and pans suddenly just opened and our pots and pans flew out and onto the kitchen floor. At the same time, we heard what sounded like muffled voices all throughout our house, going room per room. It was almost like a whole bunch of people were walking through the house as we felt vibrations on the floor, almost like the whole house was pulsating to put words to it. It wasn't loud at all, but... It's hard to describe fully since it's been a while, but that's the best that I can do. Then, I looked towards our living room and on a glass table, a globe, which was in the middle of the table, moved towards the edge and dropped to the floor. We stood there just sort of watching everything and after that, it just fell completely dead silent. We ended up going outside after this and waiting for my parents to come home and a friend of hers came over and she told her what happened. But weirdly, after that, it just never happened again. To this day, I've never had anything like that happen to me ever, and to this day, I still have no clue what actually happened. It must have been some poltergeist activity or something, though, that just randomly sparked out of nowhere. I mean, our house isn't haunted, but I have had some odd things happen to me, 
for years even, but like I said, nothing like that. What I mean is, oftentimes I'll hear my name being called out of nowhere, often when I'm alone minding my own business too. Occasionally I'll think that I'll see shadowy figures, or at least I think they're shadowy figures, walk out of the corner of my eye into the hallway. That's something that would happen a lot when I was a kid too. I think that in my recent years of becoming a, a born-again Christian, I believe that the activity has stopped and I've barely had any experiences, which makes me think that maybe it was possibly demonic in nature or something. Now, our house might have been built recently, but that doesn't mean the area surrounding it, before the subdivision that is, doesn't have some history to it. My stepmom, now my dad's current wife, because of parents' divorce in 2013, has even said that she saw a soldier at the foot of her bed when she was falling asleep one time. Or she also said that she saw a little boy that walks into the hallway, but this was just a one-time thing. I don't know, guys. What do you all think? So, I've only ever really told this story to a handful of people, and for the most part, I feel like they don't really believe me, due to the similarities with a certain popular demonic movie series which came out well after these events. But in any case, I've decided to tell this story. So, when I was 12 years old, my mum and I found a Ouija board in a toy store and thought that it would be fun to play with. We took it home, but it didn't really do anything. Next night I slept at a friend's house and I distinctly remember this because it was the first time that I got drunk. The next morning my mum picked me up and I was hung over but she didn't seem to notice. We drove to the local cemetery and went to her brother's grave who died when he was two or three. She told me that she had a friend over that night and her baby brother spoke to them through the Ouija board and he told her some terrible stories apparently and made up a story about one of the older siblings jumping on him which is what she'd been told. She started messing with the Ouija board a lot after that too and whatever it was always said that it was her brother. Within that week I had a friend whose dad actually ended his life. I'd walked to his house the day of too and his dad told me that he'd been out all night and was acting strange so I left. I'm sure now that my friend had already passed by this time and he admitted to everything that night to my friend's mum and brother. Shortly after that I went to my mum's friend's house and was watching TV while they played with the Ouija board. They called me over telling me that my friend who had just died wanted to talk but when I got onto it, it just went to nonsense really and I really don't remember a lot after that. My aunt stayed the night shortly after her and my mum played with the board. The next morning, my aunt said that she had a weird dream that the living room wall was covered with blood. Our cat started paying a lot of attention to said wall after this too, which was really weird. He would just sort of sit there and stare, bobbing his head around like he was watching a, a fly or something. But one night, my mum went to the neighbor's house and I was alone in my room and heard a really loud thump in the living room. I later described it as if someone dropped one of our very heavy candles to the floor from the ceiling. But after this, my door handle moved, which I distinctly remember. I was so scared that I just completely froze, but after a few minutes, I managed to call out to see if my mum was home. It was a small house, so I would have heard her. I opened the door and I didn't hear anything. There was nothing out of place in the living room, but in the kitchen, every door that could have been opened was wide opened and nobody was there. I ran to the neighbor's house crying and they came to investigate. I don't remember much after that, just that my mom and aunt buried the Ouija board somewhere and after it, nothing else happened. Several years later, I tried to talk to my mum about this, but she refused, saying that even talking about it scared her too much, so I'm not sure if she experienced anything more or not, but what I experienced, I'll never forget. I 
I've only told this story to three people outside the old military buddies who have similar stories to this experience to me. First, I need to set the scene though. So, tucked in a mountain valley in Baglan, Afghanistan, is a place called Russian Hill. We just called it Tapa, but Tapa is the only hill in this entire valley and uh, that's not by mistake. It's a burial mound that has existed since the time of Alexander the Great, in fact. Generations of locals have been buried here. But this also includes the dead Russians from the failed invasion back in the 80s. And now, what did the American special operations when they came to this valley do? Well, they level off the top and stick a combat outpost on it. And this, this is where my story begins. I was a regular army paratrooper attached to the special operations team that built the outpost. One of the roles of the regular army guys was to watch the radios at night. We would always get weird sort of babble on them at night, but it would be written off as sort of interference and that was it. Though I will say that years as a radio operator for my team led me to think otherwise on some instances. But I had that duty one night, 10.45 to 3 a.m., my shift ends and I walk down the hill to our little bathroom area. I'm doing my business in this little cinder block hut with a hole in it when I hear walking up the hill next to me. I at first think nothing of it, probably just one of the local guards coming up for a shift change. But being in the middle of the night and me being in a combat zone, I do listen and pay attention. I can hear the sound of gear rattling, which I know for a fact that our locals don't wear this gear buckles or boots or anything for that matter. I've been on patrol with them multiple times and they hang around the outpost. I know what they sound like when they move. And this, this was definitely not that. This was the heavy set of boots of a soldier in combat gear. Now, not wanting to die on the throne and the fact that I was one of very few Americans at this outpost, I decided that I probably needed to know who was going up the hill. So I Crack the door open a little bit and I peek outside. And yeah, there is someone on the hill. It just so happened that night too to be a mostly full moon and I had some decent ambient light. And they were carrying an AK, so definitely not American. They also had on a uniform and not the typical Afghan garb though. Definitely not one of our ALP. At this point, they're close to the top of the hill and this person isn't someone from the outpost, so I grab my rifle and I pop out the door and run up the hill after them. I get to the top pretty quickly and I do a quick search around and not a single person in sight. I hang there for a bit, just sort of keeping lookout, but there was nobody there. Confused now, I walk over to the building where the radio guard is and I knock on the door. My buddy answers and asks what's up. I check to see if anybody else was up or came in there and he said that nobody has come out of the barracks. I bummed a cigarette and laughed about what just happened. The next day while eating lunch we joked about it and one of the special ops guys who had been there longer told us that it was the resident Russian ghost. He claimed that he started appearing after they used dirt from the hill to fill our HESCO baskets for the wall. And it turns out that they had found some bones while doing it. He even told us that he had been face to face with it and he even drew his sidearm at one point. All the other guys kind of chimed in about their creepy stories of that place and apparently mine was just the latest. I got moved to another outpost a few weeks later but I always got super creepy feelings whenever we would visit there. I had a few more weird experiences there too. That country has some weird energy about it for sure, but anyway, this is getting long enough for now, and I've got to get back to it, so thanks for listening. I swear that I've been a paranormal magnet since I existed in the womb. I have an entire notes section in my phone of experiences that I can remember. And because I have so many, it's difficult to really scare me anymore. But part of their story freaked me out a lot, and I question it almost daily now. So this started in 2017. The activity in the house started to pick up more than usual that year, so seeing and hearing things just became a part of my day, and I never thought twice about any of it, really. 
One night in September, I went to bed early because I was sick and had plans the next day. Now, I'm not someone who was blessed with the ability to fall asleep instantly. I'm so jealous of those people too. But after about 20 minutes of laying with my eyes closed, I felt the corner of my bed dip down. For context too, my bed was against the wall that my door was on, so the end of my bed stopped right at the door frame, plus I slept facing the wall. I felt the dip move along the edge of my bed, all the way up to my upper back where it stopped for a second, then it went back to the door. I was a teenager with a horrendously messy room, so I just thought that it was my dad coming in to get something that I borrowed from him, and that he was using the bed to not trip over something. I turned my focus back to sleeping and feel the movement again though. Still convinced that it was my dad struggling to find something, I laid there but after the third time I realized something. I never heard my door open. At this I immediately sat up to find myself alone in my room with the door obviously still closed. Obviously I was freaked out but... I felt really tired and terrible, so I laid back down and just tried to ignore it when it started moving again. Eventually I fell asleep, but it did take some time and the movement stopped, so after a while I, I just passed out. And for the next year or so, at least once a week, I would feel something jump onto my bed and walk around a little before laying across my legs. Weirdly too, I could even feel the heartbeat of whatever it was. It would only happen while I was trying to fall asleep, but later it started walking around even if I was wide awake on my iPad at night. It would only ever stop if I turned to look at it with the early behavior, plus my mum telling me that she heard scratching from inside of my door at 6am one morning. We assumed at first that it was a dog. My childhood dogs passed away long ago, so I didn't know whose it could be, but it became an almost nightly routine that I soon found sort of comfort in, I guess. Although, there was one night that I woke up to the feeling of a full human laying next to me. The whole side of my bed was dipped down as if somebody was there. My bed is only a twin bed, so trust me, you feel anything and everything on there. But I wasn't scared, and I just went back to sleep assuming that it was my dog. A year later we moved to a new house as well, and this is where my comfort was replaced with confusion. You see... It became a nightly routine and what used to be a bit of walking, then laying down and sleeping with me, turned into constant moving. It was no longer the feeling of a larger dog laying across my calves, it was the feeling of my entire legs plus my lower back being pushed into the bed. Some nights I feel the one dog walking but more often than not I now feel multiple smaller things walking around at the same time usually one by my head, one behind me, and one at my feet. Or I feel a, let's say, human for the sake of my sanity. Just imagine someone standing at the end of your bed, putting their hands on either side of your body, and climbing onto the bed on top of you. Yeah, I don't know what that's about, but anyway, that's what it felt like. My dad told me that I should try recording it one night to see if I can see the bed moving, since I seem to be the only one experiencing this. So, about a year and a half ago, while I was watching videos before bed, I felt it come up. I was laying on my stomach with my iPad against my headboard. Without turning around, I grabbed my phone next to me and it was still walking. But as soon as I opened the camera, it stopped. So, I waited again and when I felt it, I hit record and pointed the camera at the end of my bed... It walked for a little bit and stopped again, so I tried to watch the video, but I had so many blankets that you couldn't really see anything, and it just wasn't a good shot. I was going to try again, but after that, it stopped for the night. I didn't sleep for three days starting that night, too. I was waking up every 45 minutes sort of panicked, and I mean like heavy breathing, almost crying panicked. I feared falling asleep and every time I woke up I would turn on my flashlight and stare at my closet. Yeah, closets are creepy but I was terrified of it for some reason and I have no idea why. So the next two nights I stayed up as late as I could. The little bit of sleep that I did get would be during the lighter hours of the early morning. The fourth night I was completely fine which was a relief. Slept perfectly too and had no worries about the closet. 
and I was alone in my bed those three nights. I've slept with the lights on almost every night since then, and aside from the dog turning into a human, whatever that is, and the multiple smaller things, this was really made me think, okay, so maybe the dog assumption wasn't correct. I'm not entirely sure if it was related, but I'm also not counting on it, so... Two weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night. Now, when I was a kid, I had a weird thing where at least once every couple of weeks I'd wake up in the middle of the night, hallucinate bugs everywhere around me, and throw myself out of the bed. And this was my first time doing it again in, like, years. But the weird thing was that that morning I woke up with a giant bruise on my inner leg. I know that I didn't hit anything that night because there was literally nothing for me to hit besides the floor and it's difficult to get me to bruise badly in the first place. Like I'm super clumsy I admit and even hitting table corners and really hard too or doing anything bruise inducing has never left more than those orange bruises that fade to green and go away in like four days or so. But this bruise was immediately bright purple and blue, and it hurt so bad to even touch, and took a good two plus weeks to go away. Like, there's just no way that I wouldn't have felt it in my sleep. I mean, it was huge. Anyway, sometime after that, I can't exactly remember when, but I was trying to sleep, and whatever it was would not stay still, and I was getting really annoyed. So I said something like, yeah, alright buddy, I'm going to need you to sit down or leave because I want to sleep. And to my surprise, it actually stopped for a second. But then, and I will never forget this as long as I live, there was a loud growl directly in my ear. For some reason, I wasn't scared, so I just sort of laughed at it and went to sleep. I'm not entirely sure why I reacted like that too. I know it sounds weird, but... Maybe it was the sleep delirium. Maybe I was just sick of it at this point. I'm not exactly sure, but it's what I did. And other than the aggressive nightly walking around my bed, the most recent thing was a couple of months ago, where I was sleeping, but I woke up and couldn't open my eyes, or even move. It felt like whatever it was, in its human form, if that's what you call it, was pinning me down to my bed. After a few seconds of trying to violently move my body, I finally moved and could open my eyes, so that was fun. I have so many other stories too, but they're all more just of the haha today this happened type. And perhaps I'll share more in the future, but this is an ongoing thing, so I don't know what else is going to happen. But yeah, if anyone has any idea of what this thing could be or knows how this thing works, then please let me know because... Although it freaks me out, I, I feel like if it really wanted to hurt me, it probably would have done it by now, right? So, this is a bit of a short one, but it did freak me out at the time and pretty much still to this day. And I thought that it would be good to share and see what you guys think. So it was a few years ago. I was home alone at night in my bedroom. I was just chilling on my bed and I started to sing. It's a thing that I do quite frequently. And as it was summer, I let the door of my balcony wide open to let the fresh air in. Then, for some reason, I heard some weird noises coming from outside. Like, as if someone walked into the garden. I wasn't sure at the immediate time if it was my cat or my parents simply coming home. Until I turned my head to the balcony door and I saw a pair of hands of some guy trying to climb my balcony. I panicked after seeing it and yelled, is there someone there? Then the guy fell off and went like, oh sorry, it's just me and my friends heard you singing and we thought that you were in danger so I decided to check if everything was okay before just quickly taking off. I still don't know who that was. Maybe since the house next to ours was used as a vacation lodging, the guy and his friends probably just booked the house for a few days, but I'm not really sure. And still, if he was truly worried, then why did he try to climb my balcony instead of simply knocking on the front door or even calling the police or something? I don't know. The whole thing seemed very fishy, and when I think about it, it still gives me chills. So 
This happened to me a long time ago, but I think about it from time to time, and I've used this story to teach my kids to never open the door for people that you don't know. Now, I was a kid, and we lived in a really big old house that was part of an old farm. It was on a semi-busy road, but was rural. The house was really big and had a large formal living room with a large formal dining room right behind it. There was a big double front door that opened to a sort of covered porch and a side door that went into the dining room. My mum at the time was doing laundry in the very back of the house and I was watching TV in the living room. There was a knock at the side door and while I wasn't supposed to open the door, I figured that I could peek and see. So I got up and I looked through the curtain on the side door and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was the Easter Bunny. Of course, looking back now, I know that it was a guy in a costume, but back then, I honestly thought that it was real. When he saw me too, he did a sort of little hop and asked me to let him in. I was kind of in shock and just sort of stared at him. He was in a pink suit and had a basket with eggs in it on his arm. He knocked again and acted really impatient. He said, little girl, are you going to let me in so I can hide these eggs for you? Now, I wanted those eggs real bad but he was a stranger, right? But he was also the Easter Bunny. Can the Easter Bunny be a stranger? So I asked him who he was. He sighed and said, I'm the Easter Bunny and you have to let me in right now so I can hide my eggs. Invite me in. You have to or you won't get any. I reached out to unlock the door, but all of a sudden I then got a sick feeling in my stomach and decided that I should probably check with my mum first. So I told him that I was going to go and ask my mum. He said, No, you have to invite me in. I'm here to see you. These are for you. I thought about it, and he had started to freak me out, so I yelled for my mum and I ran to tell her. I run back to the laundry room and tell my mum that there's a big Easter bunny at the front door, and he wants to come in the house. But my mum laughs and says, well, let me go and see. So she walks to the front door and, of course, Bunny Man, he's gone. Like, no trace of him anywhere. So my mum thinks that I'm a big fat fibber and made me sit on the couch and think about being a liar. And hours later, my dad comes home from work and he tells my mum that there was a robbery a couple of miles away. A little boy had apparently opened the door and a man had tied him and his mum up and robbed them. I only found out years later, too, that the guy had beat up that mum pretty badly. There was no mention of a bunny suit or anything, but what better way to get kids to let you in, right? Anyway, that was strike one for our house, and next is strike two. So it was night time, my mum was cooking dinner, and again I was in the living room just watching television. Like I said in the last story, too, the house was really large. The kitchen was behind the formal dining room behind a sort of swinging diner type door, I guess you could call it. But mum was in her own world and I'm minding my own business and there's a knock at the door again. I peek out and this time it's actually a kid. She's bigger than I am but she's still a kid. I thought it was a bit weird that a little girl was at the door at night so I opened it. There was this little girl and she was crying hysterically. She was covered in blood from head to toe. I ran and got my mum and told her that there was a kid at my door. And man, my mum was not feeling me. She was still holding a grudge over the whole Easter Bunny thing or something because she kept saying, are you sure it's real this time? But then I remembered the blood and I told my mum she has blood on her hair and on her face. And that made her drop everything and run to look. She saw the little girl and asked what had happened and apparently there was a car accident. It was right at the front corner of our property. Honestly, it was a bad wreck too, and I don't know how we didn't hear it, but my mum and I grabbed a blanket and wrapped the girl up. She yelled at my dad to get off the toilet and to come help her. She told me to call 911 and tell them that there was a bad crash and people were hurt. But my parents ran out to the accident and left the girl on the couch. I called 911, then peeked out to see if I could see anything. The car was upside down in our yard and her dad was freaking out. My mum was in the car with the girl's mum and my dad was with the dad trying to calm him down. But the weirdest thing was that time just really seemed to move so slow. 
but eventually every cop, ambulance and fire truck in the town pretty much showed up. They got it under control and my parents came back inside. Paramedics came and got the little girl too. Of course they weren't going to tell me anything because I was just a stupid kid but I heard my mum talking to somebody on the phone, I'm guessing it was the dad, a few days later and the little girl had allegedly a broken arm and a broken leg. She had been so strong to be able to get help for her parents and quite honestly she was pretty much my hero for years to come. The dad had a concussion and a broken arm and the mum was pretty messed up. She unfortunately wasn't wearing a seatbelt and had gone through the windshield. He had a massive head injury and kept asking where am I, what happened, just over and over. Thankfully she did survive but that was strike two for our house. The traffic in the road after that too was always too dangerous for us kids to play outside. Now, the next story started on a Wednesday night. I only remember this too because my dad, he played poker on Wednesdays and was never home until really late, like one or two in the morning. My mum and I were laying on the couch together just watching a TV show I think. My brother was very young and he was already in bed. We had the lights off and the TV was one of those big old console kinds. You know the type, really chunky and squarish. It was right next to the front door too and I don't know when I first noticed him but something made me look over to the window in the door. It had curtains that you could see through but unless you were super close it was hard to tell who or what was on the other side. But I definitely saw movement out of the corner of my eyes so my full attention turned there. And I could see a, a man just standing there. He was wearing a cowboy hat and was fiddling with something in his hands. Now, this house was not close to anyone at all. Our nearest neighbor was like over half a mile away in fact. So there really was no chance that someone thought that they were at a different house or it was just an innocent mistake. Upon seeing this though, I tapped my mum on the shoulder and slowly pointed at the full silhouette of a man very clearly holding a handgun. And my mum... Man, did she move fast. She grabbed me and silently ran me into my brother's room and told me to not make a sound. She scooped up my brother and we ran to the back hallway into the kitchen where she grabbed the phone to call the police. But the line, it was dead. Cut or coincidence, uh, I truly can't remember, but I just know that it didn't work at all. All we could do in the end was just sit there and pray. My mum dropped on her knees and we all three held hands while she prayed for intervention. Every once in a while, she would run to peek and make sure that he wasn't in the house. He was trying to get the door open too and after about three or four minutes, we heard the unmistakable rumble of my dad's old Chevy coming up the road. It was strange too because it was only 7.30 and he was coming home very early. The man... He must have heard it too because, man, did he take off. And I hope that he soiled his pants when my dad's truck backfired. And man, it sounded exactly like a shotgun blast. Anyway, that one was strike three and at this point, we were out for sure. That was definitely it for my mum and she told my dad too much happened and he was never home so she couldn't stand the amount of worry that she had in this house. All this happened on a Wednesday and we moved out on a Saturday. We lived in that house for a total of three months I think but those are three months that I will never forget as long as I live. So what would you do if a singular moment changed your life forever? This is actually happening as a weekly podcast from Wondery that features extraordinary true stories of moments that changed absolutely everything for ordinary people. To remember the 20th anniversary of 9-11, this is actually happening is bringing you a special four-part series called The Long Shadow, with each episode told from the perspective of a person who survived that tragic day. You'll hear from an ER doctor in Lower Manhattan, a Port Authority officer who was near Ground Zero when the planes hit, a firefighter who was on the scene, and a cardiologist finishing his residency who worked in a makeshift morgue. But we've all had moments in our lives that have given us that feeling of nothing is ever going to be the same, right? But this is actually happening will commemorate the heartbreak, courage, and bravery of the day that changed everything. 
I listened to some of these episodes and, man, was it super interesting to hear more about that unforgettable day. I remember waking up as a kid and watching the news all day just in complete shock. And I really felt like listening to the raw accounts of some of these heroes was done in a super respectful way, while still maintaining that very real and raw feeling to the accounts. It had me gripped, and I would definitely recommend listening in. So, listen to This Is Actually Happening on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery. Feel the story. Okay, so I'm an owner or operator traveling industrial electrician. I also feel for relevance to this story that I should mention that I am a woman. My job takes me everywhere, so being somewhere in the middle of nowhere with strange sounds and critters kind of comes with the territory. So does poor bathroom accommodations, to be honest. But a couple of weeks ago, we jumped on a quick turnaround, four weeks, had a, a something new to me, a plant that breaks down and processes utility grade meats. This is basically the stuff that goes into dog food and potted meat, all that wonderful stuff. It's in the uppermost corner of NW Arkansas, and man, it stinks so bad in this place, and it's still running while I'm there to do the electrical on one of the four new process lines or something. It's a large addition basically a new wing of the building. Unfortunately though, they don't have a sufficient number of portalettes, and the one that they do have, they claim hasn't been cleaned in a while because the crane is in the way. And despite the fact that the site has the equipment to move the toilets so they won't be blocked, that doesn't mean that they're going to do it. So basically, uh, I make a deal with the boss that I'll be using the bathroom for number twos at the country store about seven miles from the site. I noticed the chemical building was set a good distance behind the plant, a very typical placement. Uh, behind it they had like a slab with a condenser, then a patch of grass on a downslope that led to a four inch chain link fence. I could walk around and access a patch of woods with about four or five degrees of gentle slope before a steep drop off of about 40. And about 20 after the flat ground, there was a really lovely creek there. And that was the perfect place to pee. So, for the next week, I was in a walk-in ceiling above the boiler room and peed in a bottle mostly. I did go to the woods patch a couple of times to pee, but everything was normal. The first time that it got strange, though, was in the second week. I crossed the fence to pee on the gentle slope patch before the drop-off and something just came over me not to let my butt face the drop-off. I don't know, it was weird, like the sensation of being watched or something. I stood there and scoped it out to see if maybe another plant worker was there to take a leak, but there wasn't. It was odd, I'll admit, but I mean, whatever. Back to work came out later that day to pee and still I just felt like I wasn't alone. The feeling of being watched continued as well and I just kind of, I don't know, did my business, faced my butt away from the woods and went back to work. Until sometime in the third week, it was early in the morning and I was peeing in my spot in the woods and something just suddenly let loose. It was the unmistakable sound of a large heavy body falling down the incline. I heard the leaves crunching, the tumbling sound rolling down the hill. I jumped up in midstream, scrambling to pull up my pants. I spun around in the direction of the noise to see what it was. It took me a second of scanning too, and the only thing that I could see that didn't look normal was a sort of black lump at the bottom of the incline near a large rock. I stood for a moment, observing, thinking that possibly a bear but this thing was perfectly still and no matter how long I looked at it I couldn't make out any discernible shape it also didn't move like I was convinced that whatever it was it wasn't breathing because of just how still it was I shrugged it off though and it was weird but I went back to work I spent the next couple of days walking the distance to the field that I parked my truck to be at. 
I guess I just was not in the mood to go back to those woods after that. Eventually though, I broke down and I went back to pee in the woods at some point. I just sort of ignored the feeling of being watched, faced out into the woods, down the slope my whole time that I was out there. I repeated this for a couple of days too, until one evening, late in the day, I went to pee, but this time, as soon as I rounded the corner of the chemical building, this, I don't know how to describe it, but just wave washed over me. It was like when I rounded that corner, every instinctual alarm was telling me to get out of there right now. And of course, as stupid as a human I am, I ignored this instinctual warning and still went to pee. For some reason, and I don't know why, but I just refused to face the downslope this time and there was like a voice in my head assuring me just don't look back. Thankfully, uh, I finished peeing with no incident. Then my phone rings, which legit startled me so much, and it was my husband who was looking for me. We work together. I tell him to hang on because I hear the noise of something splashing loudly in the creek, and I turn around, and to this day, I still cannot explain what I saw. It just doesn't remotely resemble anything of this world, I, I think. I'm going to do my best to describe it, but... Bear with me because, like I said, I've never seen anything like it. So, you know those Muppets on Sesame Street whose appendages would stretch out and come back in? Imagine one of those, but all black, like Vanta black, but very fuzzy looking, just like the Muppets on Sesame Street. It ran in a bipedal fashion, but its legs would sort of slink out and get as long as it stepped. Imagine something black and fuzzy with two flailing fuzzy slinkies for legs running with matching arms flailing in a similar manner. In its locomotion, its skinny fuzzy body and neck kind of expanded and wobbled up and down too. It was just running west and cut across the creek and without breaking stride ran up on the bank. I was kind of in awe for a moment. My mind just couldn't process what I was seeing. Finally though, I frantically muttered to my husband... It's wrong, something is really wrong, I need you. Dropped my phone where I was standing and just ran back into the unit. I ended up running into my husband when I got up the stairs from the boiler room and I must have looked pretty bad because he grabbed me, shaking me a little, demanding to know what was wrong. Obviously, I couldn't really explain to him what I saw at this time. All I could get out was the black thing in the woods. My husband insisted that I show him, so I took him around the back of the chemical building to show him, and the atmosphere wasn't the same. It was much lighter, and nothing like before. When my husband looked around, saw my phone on the ground, went and got it, and looked down the drop-off, but nothing. When my husband looked at my phone, gave me a strange look, and handed me my phone. He asked me again that night what happened, but when I made efforts to describe what I saw, he seemed to get frustrated. He kept trying to compare it to known animals like a monkey, a bear, a dog, but I told him that it wasn't even close. In any case, obviously I never went to pee there again the rest of the time that I was on that job. But I'm wondering, can anyone here tell me what I could have possibly seen? Like, seriously, what did I see? What the heck was that thing? When I was 15, I found a job in a local newspaper for a live-in babysitter. It was summer, and I wanted to make some money. I lived in a rural area and didn't have transportation to get to a mall or fast food place to work at the usual jobs for teens. There was no public transportation where I lived and no jobs in the rural town that I lived in too, so this I, I had to take it. I called the number for the live-in babysitting job and a man answered. I found out that he was divorced with two young children. They were school age, elementary school and were home for summer vacation and he needed someone to watch them while he was at work. 
He spoke to my mother on the phone and she agreed to allow me to do the live-in job. As an adult, I questioned so many of her decisions, and certainly this one. But in any case, he picked me up and drove me to the house, and while driving, he told me that he was engaged. He said that his fiance was his former babysitter, and she was a few years older than I was. As a 15-year-old, this didn't set off any alarm bells. I just thought that it was weird that someone my age would want to be with an older man. He was probably in his maybe late 30s to mid 40s, I would guess. I thought it was weird when I was taking the children for a walk and a woman who lived in the neighborhood looked at me in a really odd way, like something was wrong about me walking with those children. And when I smiled and waved, she just looked away and sort of ignored me. I didn't give it a lot of thought though, just seemed strange, I guess. In any case, the house was a split level home, a style where the floor levels are split. The main living area and the bedrooms are on the top level and the lower level has just like a living room area and a single bedroom. And that was my assigned room. Now, not long after I began living in the home to babysit for this guy, he knocked on my bedroom door after I had gone to bed. I was kind of freaked out by this to be honest and I opened the door partially to ask what he wanted. He acted all friendly and asked me if I wanted a beer like he was cool with that and I simply said no and waited for him to leave and shut the door. The next day I, I told him that I no longer wanted to do the job and had him take me home. Now I didn't fully understand at that time that he was a predator who was definitely trying to groom me into having a relationship with him but I knew enough to know that something was just not right about the situation and that he was creepy and something just told me to get out of there. This occurred over a decade ago when I was 18, I think. I was visiting a friend about an hour's drive from my college dorms where I lived at the time. She had an older boyfriend who would buy us alcohol, so we hung out for a few hours in the evening, playing drinking games and just generally having a good time. By the time that I was heading back to my dorm, about 2 in the morning I think, I was far too intoxicated to be driving, but like a lot of people, I didn't let that stop me. So I took off and about a mile down the road, at the intersection to turn onto the interstate, I hit a pothole. It seemed fine at first, so I kept on going. And just as I'm entering the interstate, I heard it. My tire had gone completely flat. I pulled over just to make sure, and there's no mistake, it's gone completely flat. As I was stopped on the shoulder, an old Cadillac passed me, hitting the brakes. I could tell that they were looking at me, but I was drunk and I didn't care, and figured that I'd probably slow down and look at somebody in my situation too. I reached for my cell phone to call my friend, whose house I had just left, and as soon as I hit dial, my phone died. I didn't have a car charger or anything too, but I knew how to change a tire, and I knew that there was a trucker pull-off up ahead, in an area locals refer to as the bean field. The bean field is basically just a large swath of woods and fields on either side of the interstate. I think it's not developed because of its proximity to a landfill, but I don't really know. Either way, I drove slowly up to the trucker pull-off. Nobody was there, except that old Cadillac that I saw earlier. His car was off, but his headlights were on and they were pointed straight into those woods. And I don't know what it was about it, but seeing that car there like that just sent chills through me. I was questioning whether or not it was the same car that slowed down on the interstate before, even though I knew that it was. I guess that I just didn't want to think that I was in danger. I kept telling myself, at least it's not a cop. At least it's not someone who could get me in trouble. When I look back, I can't believe that the worst case scenario going through my mind at the time was being arrested or being an intoxicated minor and driving drunk. Still, I, I parked on the opposite side of the pull-off, thinking if someone was going to come for me, I would at least have a few seconds to react. I then sat and I waited. Nervously, I watched his car. What was he doing? He stayed in his old Cadillac and 
After about 20 or 30 minutes of just sitting there, I thought that I'll just change the tire as quickly as I can. I got out of my car and I got my jack and my tire iron from the trunk. Still no movement from the man in the Cadillac, so I loosened the lug nuts and I started to jack up my wheel. I almost had the car lifted enough to change the wheel too when I heard a door open. The man was coming straight towards me. I picked up my tire iron and I got back in my car, locked all the doors and watched him walk towards my car with something in his hands. Maybe his own tire iron? I'm not sure, but... We were the only people around. The interstate was empty at this stage, with the exception of a passing car here and there. I was drunk, sweating, shaking, and the intensity of this situation was really beginning to sink in. In fact, as I'm sharing this with you, the feeling is beginning to come back to me. I started telling myself that if you have to, you fight for your life. He stood by my door for a few seconds, then knocked don't know what possessed me to do this, but I cracked my window just slightly. He asked, having car troubles, and I said, no, I can change my own tire. I would just like if he would leave me alone. But he didn't leave. Instead, he started telling me that he just dropped his two-year-old grandbaby off with his daughter. She lives in this area. He just stops here sometimes to watch the deer. He said that he just got an automatic jack, and why won't I just let him help me? He was persistent. He kept saying that he could get my car up in no time. I kept saying no, and until he leaves, I'm not going to get out of my car. I gripped my tire iron, and he started becoming angry, and he wasn't going anywhere. And just then, blue lights flashed behind me. I was honestly so scared at this point that I was about to wet my pants when the cop walked up and asked what was going on. I tried to tell him, but the man cut me off. Oh, um, I'm just helping her change her tire. I've got it under control and a number of other excuses to try to get the cop to leave. He didn't leave. He told the man that he would take over from here and to go on home. He must have seen the fear in my face and he said that I could get out of the car and that he could stay with me. So I got out, noticeably swaying and slurring. I opened my trunk again to get my donut and was horrified that... I had an empty 30 pack and some empty cans were just rattling around in my trunk. Surprisingly though, the policeman didn't really seem to care that much. He changed my tire. The man was still lingering off to the side, trying to make small talk with this cop. I think as an excuse to stick around until he was gone. Until he had to forcefully tell him to get away from me before he finally got into his old Cadillac and left. He even followed me to a gas station and aired up my donut for me and followed me probably halfway back to my dorms before he finally turned off and went his own way. To this day, I still think that that officer, he saved me from something that night. He saved me from a shallow grave in the beanfield. The story I'm about to tell you guys has never been discussed outside of my immediate family. All of this took place in a matter of minutes. I'm going to go into exact detail so that you guys can decide for yourself what really happened that night. Because I don't know what to think. So 2002, New England. I'm finally settled into bed. I fall asleep the moment that my head hit the pillow. I was catching an early night in the AM for business. And suddenly I hear my eight-year-old son Russell running down the hall, rounding the corner that enters our bedroom. All I can think to myself is, not tonight, Russ. But it's like he has a built-in alarm system that goes off every time that I have a business trip. But Russ and I are no stranger to this drill. He always stands a few feet from my side of the bed and whispers, I don't feel good. He doesn't want to wake his dad, who has to see patients in the morning and is quick to debunk Russ's plan to stay home from school. Exhausted, I go into mum mode and recite the ailment list. Okay, Russell, is it your head? It's your tummy. Are you hot? Are you cold? No answer. I force myself to sit up now. I glance at my alarm. It's like 3.40 a.m. I don't turn on the light, although in reality my husband could sleep through a tornado. 
Uh, Russell, you need to answer me. What hurts? No answer. Okay, Russ. Come with me. I'll take you back to bed. I reach for my glasses on the nightstand. I put my hand out to Russ, but now seeing his small outline in the dark. Only something isn't right. Although my room is dark, the child in front of me was so much darker than the actual room. He is the same height as Russell. He's wearing the same red shorts and t-shirt that I helped Russ into at bedtime. But never have I seen a child so severely emaciated. His arms and legs look like thin spindles. He has no hair. I can't turn away from his hollowed out eyes and he seems to be looking nowhere. His mouth is quite full, almost too large for his thin face, with corners that turn up creating a sort of strange forced smile. The high bridge of his nose reminded me of the profiles that you see in Egyptian hieroglyphs, and he looks as though he may be sleepwalking or lost. Deeply confused, is this a friend Russell took home, or a child who somehow wandered into our home? Deeply confused, is this a friend Russell took home, or... A child who somehow wandered into our home? Keeping my eyes on him, I try to reach for my husband. I need to shake him awake, but he's at the very edge of our king-size bed and I can't reach him without moving completely from my spot. And I can't bring myself to move an inch. So I call out to my husband. Michael, wake up. Please, wake up. Somebody's in our house. He continues snoring. The child is perfectly still now looking directly at me. I lean forward to examine him more closely, but to my horror, I realize that this, this is not a child. Rocking side to side now on its thin feet, I can see that it's grinning. It kept making a sort of guttural sound followed by a child's soft cry that sounded exactly like Russell's, yet its mouth never opened quickly tilting its head to one side as if trying to ask me a question. A low humming begins like the sound of a TV, and I'm trembling, but my rational brain tells me that this has to be a dream, a lucid dream, but how can I be dreaming if I'm sitting up like this? I can read the time on my clock, I see my nightstand, my bureau, I touch my face, my hands, I touch my eyes, they're definitely open. I now have no doubt that I'm awake, and the figure instantly starts to move again, stepping closer in a quick disjointed movement as if it has a sort of severe curvature of the spine. It's too much for my brain to acknowledge. I've never been this frightened in my life, but I feel like I have to remain strong. I need to figure out what's going on here. It's slowly moving backwards in the exact way that it moves forwards, but about two yards away now. I call out for Michael once more. He mumbles but still in a deep sleep. And then, all of a sudden, the figure starts to dissipate, dissolving quickly into a sort of smoke that resembled a spider's web, spinning rapidly into one large smoke sculpture forming into what looks like a hideous head of a creature. I would describe it as a dragon's head if I had to, that I had frequently seen in Asian architecture, but the low buzzing just became louder. The creature is looking directly at me now, I only remember its amber eyes that were sort of long narrow slits and then it charges directly at me as fast as lightning and it hits my chest. I am then knocked flat on my back rendering me breathless. Screaming at the top of my lungs now I finally woke Michael who jumped out of bed and turned the lights on. Russell came running in too asking what the heck that us two were screaming about. I'm trying to sleep in case you forgot too but... Michael immediately understood that I was distraught. He picked up Russell, putting him at ease. Mummy just had a bad dream, he said. You know what that's like, Russ, don't you? He put Russ back to bed and joked about Mummy being a big crybaby, and I heard Russell laughing and knew that he would be okay. Although, I was pretty horrified that I had woken up my family like this in this disturbing way. Michael rushed back in quickly and closed our bedroom door. Calm down, Marla. You're hysterical. I was completely filled with dread. Michael, something... Something was really in our room. I thought it was Russell, but... It was something horrible. 
not human. Marla, it was a bad dream, all right? I told you it was too soon to return to work. The effects of meningitis don't vanish overnight, you know. Many patients recovering have terrible hallucinations, especially creative people like you. Think of it as your brain rewiring, healing itself. Michael, I know you don't believe this, but I'm telling you, something physically knocked me down. I've never felt this way before in my entire life. Please, Michael, I wasn't dreaming. I need you to believe me. Michael returned soon and handed me a mild sedative. Take another big sip of water, Marla. You're going to cancel your business trip, all right? It's obvious that you're too stressed. Your work can wait. All that really matters right now is that you're okay. Remember, you're Russell's mother and he's our first priority, right? You're his safe place and you can't continue to scare him with all of this. But Russell was so upset while you're in the hospital. Please, let's not add to it, all right? I love you, Marla, and I promise that you'll be just fine. It's the healing process of your brain, all right? You definitely experienced a hallucination, and it's an unusual sleep disorder, but it happens. And look, I understand that it was frightening. It probably felt very real, but it was just a dream. But why don't you take Russell to the beach tomorrow and enjoy yourself and have some fun? He kisses me and tucks me in, and... I just can't shake the dread, the fear, and my heart was physically hurting at this point. I can't stop the tears. I know Michael is right. He's always been my voice of reason. No malice, no dishonesty. It's simply his need to fix things, to find solutions. It's just how he's wired, and in fact, it's why I love him. But I would be lying if I said that my life didn't change that night. And my belief system, I fear will never be the same again after that. When I was about nine years old, I lived in a 1930s built-in apartment flat. I lived there since I was a baby with my mum, dad, and disabled little brother. My bedroom in the house was down a long corridor that had no windows, so it was always a bit dark. As a child, I was always very scared of being alone in that corridor and would run the length as quickly as possible to get to the front room and what I felt was safety. Around the age of nine, I was getting a lot of pushing from my parents to go to bed on my own as, until this point, my dad would lay with me until I fell asleep and then would leave. About the time I started to go to sleep on my own too, I started to have reoccurring dreams about waking up in the night with an old man with no arms and legs hovering above the bottom of my bed. I never told anyone and would instead creep into the kitchen with my blanket and pillow and sleep there till morning. I did this to avoid the old man. Now, every morning my parents would find me and tell me off for sleeping in the kitchen, but I refused to speak to anyone about my reasons. I continued to experience the same nightly encounter with the old man with no arms or legs, and over time I started to make out more and more about him and his features. This man looked to be in his 60s. He looked round and sort of plump. His bald head had age spots and moles on it. The man never talked, but always just sort of looked at me without blinking. After multiple encounters, I could see that the man's arms and legs were stumps rounded, and the ends were as if they had been taken from him a long time ago. One of the strangest things about the whole experience, though, was the sort of damp smell that I would get in my house when he would appear. Anyway, a year and a bit of almost nightly encounters would start to gradually become once in a week and then once a month until it was once every so often with no frequency. I turned 13 on the day that we moved house and never had that experience again but sometimes recalled it. Over time, the memory faded until years later and me being 26 and my daughter now too, I went to my mum's house as I do every Sunday. I got to talking about sleepless nights with my daughter and my mum recalled the memories of me sleeping on the kitchen floor. I decided to explain too that I was having dreams about this old man with no arms and legs for the first time and my mum, her face dropped as I recalled my experiences with this old man. I first thought that this look was due to finally understanding her son's childhood distress but I was wrong, really wrong in fact. You see, my mum explained that the previous tenant was in fact an old man 
who had his arms and legs taken due to infections from diabetes. My mum had lived her whole life in that area and seen this man lots of times too. And from my description, my mum said that I had described the very same thing. I was horrified to say the least, but my mum continued and said that sometimes in the night, she would wake up to a sort of old smell that she could only smell at night and would be gone in the morning. But my mum put the smell down at the time to drains and other explainable things. She also explained how she would come into my room in the morning to find things moved around, but put this down to restless sleeping children playing with toys. I can tell you though that I never played with toys at night. I always pulled my cover over my head and made a breathe hole and just waited to be scared, tired and alone for that old man to come my way. This is going to be pretty long, but I'm giving a lot of context because, well, it's a big decision that I need help with, and I want to give as many details as possible, so hopefully I make the right one. So I recently found a job in a nearby town, but it is far enough that I had to move because it was not possible to drive to work every day. I live with my girlfriend, and since I wasn't so sure about this job opportunity, I first went alone for a week to try it out, before making a more definitive decision about moving. One of the reasons that made me come here too was that when I told my employer that I lived far enough so I would have to move, he mentioned a place that I could stay for really cheap that was conveniently close to work and belonged to a friend of his. So I got a number and I called the guy, and it was indeed cheap considering where it was located and the size of it too. Before the first day of work, I met the landlord and we went to see the place. The apartment, it was really big and right next to my workplace. The only drawbacks are that it seems to be a fairly old building with four floors, one for each apartment, and it has no elevators. And since I live on the first floor, it's a reasonable amount of stairs, let me tell you. When I went inside for the first time though, I only saw a huge empty apartment with absolutely no furniture. It has four bedrooms, all of different sizes. The kitchen is huge and the living room is even bigger. The only thing that really bothered me at first was that the ceiling is pretty low, but I guess that's a common thing in old buildings. Now, my landlord had nothing special about him other than that he asked me if I could stay in a hotel for the first night because he needed to get things ready before my arrival. So I did that. But when I moved in on my second day, it seemed like everything was pretty much exactly the same, so I really don't know why he asked me to wait like that. Anyway, my first week went by fast. I would arrive home always tired, and since I had a sleeping bag and my suitcase with me, I mostly slept and or stayed on my phone when I was home. But the job is nice, and it pays really well, considering how little I spend on rent, so after pondering for some time, I decided to stay and move in for real with my girlfriend and some furniture. She works from home, so moving would not be much of a problem for her too, which was convenient. So my girlfriend and I were excited to adventure ourselves in a new place with all different people and things to do. Our first week together went pretty well too, and nothing could be more perfect really. But then things started to get weird on week three. When we had finished setting up a net on the balcony to prevent the cat from jumping out. And so when everything was ready, we brought him in. He is usually really chill too, but the moment that we opened his cat carrier inside the apartment, he just would not come out of it and would seem really stressed and sort of agitated. For the following days, he would spend most of his time inside of his carrier too. And according to my girlfriend, he would only get out on rare occasions and would stay close to her all the time, not ever exploring the surroundings. On week three, I also met a neighbor on the stairs one day and he made a joke about how people would always be moving in and out of my apartment, which later I found out one of my co-workers had stayed there for a short period of time but wouldn't give me a straight answer on why he left. And it wasn't long after that too that my girlfriend started giving me some signs that something just wasn't right. She would have humor changes and would act sort of weird on some occasions. 
Eventually, she started messaging me to come home immediately too from work because she just did not feel good while home alone, even though she's used to that because of her job. Like I mentioned, she works from home. I suggested to her to take her computer and go work somewhere else, like maybe a cafe or a park during the day, but she said that she didn't want to leave the cat alone, which is something she seemed to like before, but not anymore. So that was weird. But at first her complaints were reasonable. Quickly though, they just started to sound a little bit bizarre if I'm being honest. Like... First she told me the apartment was suffocating and would lack sunlight during the day, and that it would be cold at all times. Then it quickly progressed to an absolute terror of being alone inside. One day she even brought our sofa out to the balcony and would stay there with the cat all day, only coming inside when I got home. At first I thought her change in behavior was just due to the fact that we were in a new town and everything about our routine had changed. But the deterioration of a situation was quick and from week 4 to week 5, things were really getting out of control. Also around that time, I started getting extremely tired and kind of sick frequently too. Sore limbs, headaches and difficulty sleeping. Obviously that deeply affected our relationship too and it culminated in a bad argument in one weekend while we were at my parents' house in my hometown. After that, she cried a lot and finally opened up, stating things that I would never have thought she would say in a serious manner, like that she would see shadows constantly and hear weird animal-like sounds coming from the empty bedrooms. Now, even though I lived there too, besides feeling kind of sick and tired a bit, I had never experienced anything like that. And I even started to think that it had something to do with depression or simply loneliness. I asked her to give it one more chance and she agreed to come back with me on the condition that we would leave the cat with my parents for a while, since at this point he had almost stopped eating altogether. And it was at the beginning of week 5 when on the first Wednesday of coming back without the cat, she woke up screaming in the middle of the night saying that she suddenly opened her eyes and saw someone standing on our doorstep. Obviously, I quickly stood up and searched around the apartment and found nothing. But at that moment, I got deeply creeped out when I realized that our room door was completely open and we always leave it closed, especially because of the recent circumstances. And our room door really clicks and it's just not possible that it would have opened by itself like that. After that too, she started crying a lot and I had to take her by car to her parents' house in our hometown in the middle of the night and come back so that I could go to work the next day. This all happened last week and since then she stayed with her parents and I went back alone to our apartment. What happened that night, it definitely changed the way that I saw things because no matter what, I just couldn't come up with a logical explanation for the door being open like that. And then, it started to affect me. So the next days I spent there alone started to make me feel really uncomfortable. I would be really tired all of the time and the only thing that would actually give me the courage to go back home would be an extreme urge to sleep. And I just started to become afraid of my own place. For two or three days, the only things I did were work and sleep. I barely ate, and it seemed like it was all part of a long dream, which I just couldn't wake up from. But then came the events of the 27th of October. So a couple of nights ago, I went back home after work as usual, and I felt extremely tired, so I just ate a sandwich and I went to bed. That was around 7.30. The weather was clear and there were no signs of rain or strong wind or anything. But at around 9.30 I woke up really thirsty and having a bit of trouble breathing. So I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water. And before I could go back to sleep I noticed the window of my room was completely open. Now I always leave that one closed and there was no wind that day as far as I can remember. But since I was kind of sleepy I... Didn't think too much of it and just sort of closed the window and went directly back to sleep. Sometime after that, I woke up again. This time though, I felt something I had never felt before. 
a really uncomfortable feeling, almost as if I was being held by something, if that's the right way to say it. Once again, though, I stood up and I noticed the window was open again. As I closed it, I felt really afraid for the first time and I thought to myself that I'm an adult man and that what was happening was ridiculous and would probably feel very silly in the morning. But then it happened. So I woke up again in the middle of the night, I would say probably around 3 or 4 if I had to guess, and this time I felt something really heavy over my body and as soon as I opened my eyes I swear to you that I saw the silhouette of a creature like thing. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was over my torso and pressing my body against the bed. I really couldn't distinguish it very well because it was dark, but man, I started to scream like my lungs were bursting and after a moment, I managed to wake up and turn the lights on. And as soon as I saw that window was open once again, I felt terror and desperation like I've never felt before and literally ran downstairs to the garage and got inside the car immediately. I left the building and started to drive around to try to calm my nerves. After some time, I decided to not go back there that night, so instead I went to the hotel that I'd stayed in on my first night here. And truthfully, I only went back there yesterday morning to grab a few things, and I've been staying in the hotel ever since. I am still really confused about all of this and thinking a lot because leaving that apartment means leaving my job because otherwise it isn't worth staying in this town if I have to spend two thirds of my salary on just rent. It's a really serious decision with real life consequences too and I want to be sure about what I'm doing. Neither I or my family have ever been religious or spiritual and I don't personally know anyone that I could talk to about this issue while being sincere because this is just a completely new aspect of life that I'd never even considered before or even thought it was real to be honest. And I guess that's why I thought I should share it here. I'm hoping that maybe someone here will believe me and maybe, maybe someone can help me. So yesterday night, a group of around seven friends and I decided to play live action Among Us. It's a super popular game right now, and since there aren't a lot of Halloween activities happening due to COVID, we decided that this would be fun for the October feeling. If you don't know what Among Us is, it's basically a game where up to 10 people are crewmates who must perform tasks, but two of these crewmates are alien imposters trying to kill the crew off one by one. When a body is found, crewmates can try their best to pick out who the imposter is. Anyway, but we all had flashlights and glow sticks. Glow sticks are left where bodies are found and flashlights are to see. So we decided each task was about 20 seconds in total, placed at different points on my friend's property, dense woods. And towards the end of our game, I was standing at a tree doing a task. Everything was fine, I don't really fear the dark of the woods, so I felt totally content. But then, I felt it. Someone was next to me. I didn't hear leaves crunch, so I was really confused as to how they got next to me like that. I initially thought that it was one of my friends who was the imposter sneaking up to kill me, but it wasn't, and I froze. I literally fawned next to this massive tree, hands extended to mimic doing my task. After a full minute of dead silence, even the noises of the forest stopped, I looked over. I only moved my eyes though, I didn't dare move my head, because I felt like whatever it was would actually try to hurt me if I moved. And next to me was a seven foot tall figure just standing there. Now, I'm already a rather tall female at 5'10", so this was really bizarre to me. There's no way that it could have been any of my friends, I mean, they're all around 5'7 or shorter. But I looked eye contact with this thing very briefly before it spoke. It was definitely a male's voice and it said, oh, hello. But it sounded like it wasn't where it was supposed to be, if that makes sense. Like, it knew that I shouldn't be seeing it. 
The strange thing, though, was that I even felt its breath on me, which was hot and almost sticky. I glanced back at the trees and back to it, but when I did, it was completely gone. I mean, it had vanished right into thin air. I even looked around a bit, but I didn't hear any footsteps, crunching leaves. I heard nothing. I stayed at that tree, looking around wildly for a few seconds, when my friend finally approached me. And she told me that the game was over almost two hours ago, and apparently they'd been calling and looking for me the entire time. I shook my head, because it had felt like only a few minutes, no more than five, but she insisted, and when we rejoined the group, they all told me the same thing. I never did tell them what I saw. I really don't know how to tell them. It is on my friend's property, so I guess I would suggest putting up cameras, but what even was it? I try now to remember its features, but either I was just too shocked to pay attention, or it didn't have any features other than its eyes. A cold, dark brown, almost black, and... I don't know, has anyone encountered something like this? I can tell you honestly that I've never been so terrified of anything like that in my entire life. I've also never felt the breath of anything otherworldly that's ever spoken to me like that. I mean, I guess I've seen and heard things before, but nothing like this. My ex-girlfriend and I were playing video games late one night at her father's house when she decided that she wanted to go home. We were neighbors living in the country and our homes were well within walking distance of each other. I noticed the time was 3 in the morning so I continued playing a few matches with her brother before I too decided that it was time to go home. At 3.30 I walked outside to pure darkness. The moon and the stars were missing so it was a really dark night. I couldn't see a thing and noted that the many dogs that usually greet me before I leave just were not there like normal. The silence was odd, I have to admit. I assumed that they must have followed my ex home. I waited for my eyes to adjust to the darkness before I left, but after what felt like 10 minutes, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I know the trail back well enough to walk it blind, so I did just that. There is a bush between her father's home and ours, and as I entered, I started to get this feeling of dread. All my senses were warning me of something that I couldn't see. My anxiety was beginning to rise, but I steeled myself against my paranoia and kept going. Once I was out of the bush, I saw the outside light shining in the distance. When about halfway down the trail, I heard this tremendous crashing sound directly from behind me. The sounds of snapping branches and rustling weeds with the rumble of legs beating the ground. I turned around thinking the dogs were coming to escort me home. But boy, I was wrong. This thing was definitely no dog. Time seemed to slow as I realized that this was nothing that I've ever seen before in my life. In fact, I still question if I actually saw anything. Maybe it was just in my head, but... It was blacker than the night, a void in the shape of some sort of humanoid creature with a feline head. It's difficult to describe the absence of light having definition, but its black skin was stretched out over a sort of skeletal body. I'm a fairly tall guy too, and this thing's back looked like it was the height of my torso. But the shock of the encounter startled me into making a pathetic noise that makes me feel emasculated even thinking about it. But I quickly went into fight or flight and I decided to fight this thing. I stomped my foot in a display of aggression and put my hands ready to hit this thing. It stopped ten or so feet in front of me and that's when I noticed that it had hands. At mid stride it paused and I saw it had black long slender fingers. For a moment it just sort of seemed to stare at me, turned and then ran back to where it came from without making a sound. One thing that I do remember is that it didn't have any tail and I'll always remember just how graceful this thing looked running the other direction. Its movements were just so fluid. 
My adrenaline was peaked though at this point, and I was making these deep, powerful breaths as I walked back inside. But when I locked the door, I had this sensation wash over me telling me that locking the door was a useless gesture. I had the sudden feeling that reality was porous and that safety was, well, just an illusion. I eventually spoke with people about what I saw and I'm told that apparently it was a water spirit. Elders in the area told me that it's been there well before their parents first warned them of its presence. I'm told it's powerful and can be summoned by people who use bad medicine and one day I gathered my courage and did a search of the bush. I found a swamp in the center of it. I never even knew it was there in all my years of living in that area too. I love the night, but that encounter has me think twice before I go outside alone now. If I do, I always bring a hunting knife with me, but I don't know if that will be of any help against something like that. Nevertheless, I guess I find comfort in my willingness to fight back if it ever did attack me again. However, I don't know if it intended on harming me, or maybe it was sending me a message... I still can't explain where that claim of reality being porous came from, but that's just what it felt like. Again, I don't know if I actually saw this thing, or maybe I was just hallucinating or something. Maybe it was lack of sleep. I don't know, but I'll never forget just how scared I was that night. All my life I've been living in different houses because I rent. And well, my story happened when I lived with my parents, but we also rented. And it started when I was 11. It was a normal midnight when I heard someone crying in the living room. So my first thought was that it was my mum and dad and they'd had a discussion and she was there crying because it was a female voice. So I went downstairs to check on her and... When I saw the sofa, the first thing that I realized was that the figure was of a woman and she was laying on it. Also the first thing that I did was I went to touch her head and hair and just when I said, Mummy, what happened? I felt a horrible chill and something inside of me made me run all the way through to my parents' room but when I opened the door I saw my mum was sleeping with my dad on their bed. I must have stood there for at least a minute sort of peering down the hallway and trying to process what the heck just happened. That night I took my pillow and a bed cover and I slept in my parents room on the floor. I never did tell them what happened but before this happened in that same house I always felt afraid of the dark for some reason. I slept in a bunk bed at that time so after that I always slept under the covers and I always had a blanket coming off the top bed from that point on because it sort of acted like a fort. Nowadays I have no idea what I touched but I do remember clearly that night like it was yesterday. Anyway I still have no explanation for what happened that night but it felt real and I'm curious what do you guys think what happened? Nowadays, I have no idea what I touched that night, but I remember it clearly, and it was definitely real. I'm curious, though, what you guys might think. What do you guys think I touched that night, and do you think it was real, or do you just think that it was in my head? When I was about 10 or 11, my sister, who would have been about 15 and I brought my brother who would have been about two at the time to the beach down the road from our holiday home. But just to add to this beach had a massive car park just in front of it as it was often very busy during the summer. Anyway I'd been swimming for a while and when I was done I went up to one of the shower things to rinse myself off. My sister and brother were waiting up there for me my brother being in his pram. I'd been wearing a wetsuit because it was absolutely freezing. Thank you, Ireland. So I asked my sister could she zip the back of it down as I wasn't able to reach it myself. The thing is though is that the shower area was on a slope so there was no way that she would have been able to bring the buggy down so she brought it as close to the edge as she could which was no more than a foot or two away. She gave my brother one last look before turning to me and pulling down my wetsuit. 
But this task took her no more than 10 seconds, I would say. But when she turned around, my brother and his buggy were gone. Of course, she immediately started panicking, looking around the area to find him. The next thing I knew, she took off running, screaming at people to help her. It was only when I looked that I saw this old man trying to put my brother into his car, an older woman in the driver's seat with the engine started. I could see that the distance between my sister and the car was quite a bit and there was no way that she was going to get there before they took off. And even if she did, I'm not sure how much she would have been able to do. So she kept screaming as she ran down the footpath trying to get the attention of as many people as she could. To this day, I honestly thank God for a random man and his wife standing near this car. He heard my sister screaming about our brother and the man putting him into his car. The man ran to the car and tried pulling my brother out of this would-be snatcher's arms while his wife rang the police. Luckily, he managed to get my brother out of the man's arms before handing him off to my sister, who had just gotten to them seconds beforehand. And honestly, to this day, I don't know how it happened, but the would-be snatchers managed to get away, driving away from the beach. When the police arrived, my sister and the man who helped us gave as much as they could in relation to the descriptions of the two people, but they couldn't even get any license plate number as the car had gone at this stage. I still think about it to this day, and the one thought that always crossed my mind was what would have happened if the man wasn't there to help us? I just I think that I would have had a little brother after that, if that would have been the case. So I'd like to preface this by saying that I was young and drunk for the most part of this, so... My bad decision making, while annoying I admit, was not out of pure ignorance. I was 20 female at an anime convention. My 21st birthday was coming up a month later, so my roommates decided to let me, well, get smashed as long as I stayed in the room or left with someone that I trusted. I was staying with a large group of people in one of the nicer hotel rooms there. I'd been to quite a lot of conventions and never really had a bad experience, outside of a, a few cosplay creepers and terrible people at times. But the weekend went pretty normal, except that I was drunk and my group was throwing small parties. On the night of a particularly not so fun one too, I decided to drunkenly leave the room and go roam around the main lobby. And that was when I met Stephen. I still have no idea how old Stephen was, but he was at least an adult, maybe a little older than me. We ran into each other at a manga table, and he mentioned how he loved the manga that I was holding. I didn't really read manga, and just like the artwork. I'm an anime Andy, but I still listen to him gush about the story for a few, because whatever, he seems nice enough. I didn't say much to him outside of, oh yeah, and that sounds really cool. I thanked him for the info and I walked away. After an hour or so of roaming around, I decided to head back up to my room. Back in my room, I had taken two shots with my roomies and was laying on the couch when we got a knock on the door. The music and the talking quietened down as it was customary to shush when somebody knocked, in case of con security coming to shut down our party. That's when my roommate who answered the door said, Veronica? Yeah, she's here, come on in followed by silence and then my roommate calling my name and telling me someone is here for you. Now, two things drunk me didn't think about were the fact that I didn't tell Stephen my name. Our interactions lasted five minutes max and I gave no information to him. On top of that, my name is more complicated and hard to pronounce. The one that I gave here is fake. But maybe I assumed that he just described me and my roommate knew who he was talking about. But I didn't give him my room number. No, we were several floors up in the suites area. You'd have to take a different elevator to get to the room than you would get to a standard hotel room. Like I said though, I definitely didn't think about that. Instead, I just walked to the door and there Stephen was, smiling. He asked me to go for a walk with him and I drunkenly said yes. I mean, he's just an awkward anime dude who just wanted a friend to hang out with. We were walking and he was talking to me about how he recently was watching an anime where the protagonist wouldn't stop killing the girl that he liked. I've since googled that anime plot and have not been able to find one similar to what he was talking about outside of some Yandere anime or something. But 
I got a little creeped out as the hall was empty and we were walking with no plan of where it was going. But he then began to talk about his favorite serial killers, how he was a huge crime junkie and how he followed a lot of cases. A big red flag went off in my head at this and I decided that it was time to try to go back to my room. But then he stopped walking and just sort of stared at me. You know, I know a really cool spot that we can go. If you take the staff elevator, you can go all the way up to the top of the hotel. It's really pretty. And all of a sudden, he was breathing a, a little oddly and his hands were shaking. I said no, as I had some sense left in my head still. But then he grabbed my arm as hard as he could and started pulling me, yanking me towards the staff doors. I instinctively pulled back, asking him to stop, and he told me to just be quiet. I yanked free of him and started running. He chased after me, telling me to stop. I was nearly in tears at this point and wondering why the hallways were so empty as one of the most crowded cons that I'd ever went to. When I finally ran into a group of girls, they saw the fear on my face and immediately pulled me into their group, asking me about the hair and the makeup, wrapping their arms around me. I was crying, telling them what had just happened, and when I looked back, Stephen, he was gone. I didn't see him for the rest of the con, but I stopped being so friendly at cons because of him after that. I would also like to say that Stephen is the name that I gave him, but I never got his name personally. I told con security about him and my roommates and friends used the buddy system with me for the rest of the convention. I would like to say that the guy was caught and something happened to him but the truth is is that I think that he got away. The year was 2014. I'm a white American on a college economics trip to South Africa. The main focus was the apartheid, but included a separate side trip to Mozambique to witness the Soviet Union's impact on the country. Our trip was led by an influential economic Russian advisor, and he found the safest way to see Mozambique was by the way of a cruise ship off the South African coast. Cue our first exhibition of the ship, a day trip to the capital of Mozambique. The bus ride was exciting and informative. We were able to learn some history, see where Blood Diamond was filmed, etc. After about 30 minutes or so in the bus, we were driven into the city center, and people were immediately banging on the windows as they saw a bus full of tourists and were eager to sell their handcrafts. This didn't bother me in the least, as I understood the economic situation was not ideal here, and opportunity knocks. Upon exit of the bus, we were presented with a map of tourist attractions for foreigners, Picture it as like A, B, C, D, respectively labelled as church, statue, cemetery, market. A, B and C were all in the city square, but D was one street up and to the left. Our group, Russia professor and 10 students, 8 girls and 2 boys, wandered around sites A, B and C with wide eyes as this was a very foreign environment and we were eager to soak it all in. Come time, we've finished exploring the city square and we're ready to head up the street to the listed market. That's D. Blindly trusting and following the front half of the group, I just sort of wandered, slowly realizing that the environment around me to be more and more suspicious. The empty streets of the city center turned into smaller, sort of busier side streets, full of merchants selling what they could for a buck. Off the top of my head, I remember deconstructed cell phones, sold for parts, a variety of what seemed to be lost shoes, only one shoe per pair for sale, and a sort of mixed match of spices. Mesmerized by the sights and the sounds around me, I was completely blind to the body language of many people passing by. Not until a local woman grabbed my arm specifically and asked me sternly, what are you doing here? I frantically pull out my map and say, oh, uh, we're going to the market, here, D. She looks at me with urgency and tells me to immediately return to where I've come from, as they are planning to take me. While this all sounds very cryptic, please understand that I'm a blonde, white female, in a foreign country, in a group with only three other men. I am not culturally unaware, but I guess I had a false sense of security due to our little map. 
So I immediately notified my teacher, to which he replied, Oh yes, maybe we are lost. And we headed safely back to the bus. But the horror of a possible kidnapping, it still haunts me to this day. I'm forever thankful too to that woman who warned me. Me specifically because I have a big mouth and I'm afraid her threats may have fallen silent had she warned another girl in our group. I've traveled around the world before and after this encounter too, but nothing sticks in my mind so deeply as that day. Thankfully, it's taught me to be even more vigilant, and I hope anyone listening to this that I'll do the same. So I'm a 26-year-old female, and I live in the northwest of the United States, four hours drive above Salt Lake City. I'm going to sum this up a, a bit, but I have religious people, mostly Mormons, come to my door from time to time. I'm always polite to them and listen to what they have to say and just say no thank you at the end. But yesterday, I had three guys come to my door. They were, I think, 16 to 18, maybe older, and wearing nice dress clothes. They stated that they were Mormon and started off by stating that they were trying to get a law passed to increase taxes for unmarried individuals versus married couples. I stated that taxes are already higher if you are single. They asked what do I do and if I felt loved and accepted. I replied that I'm in college pursuing my bachelor's degree and yes, I do feel loved and I'm not always accepted. They said that they know what it's like to feel like they're not accepted and that their group could help. Their group has love, and since I'm not married, they said that they could have a husband arranged for me, that I would get to pick a husband from five different suitors of their choosing, and would never have to work a day in my life, and you'll never be lonely again. I could just be a housewife, and wouldn't have to do their 18-month recruitment as long as I produce a child within two years. I said, I already have a significant other, and I'm not lonely, so... They asked if we were going to be married within six months because they could have me guaranteed to be married within the time period. I said, I don't know, this is not my decision to make and we're content where we are. They then said, well, he can also have another wife to assist with the housework so you'll never be overwhelmed. I said that we are monogamous and fine with where we are. They said that he could come work for them and he could go to trade school paid for by them. However, he would have to give like 10 to 50% or 15%, maybe I misheard that, of his income to the church to go to food banks, healthcare and anything that we would need. They then said, or you could entice an outsider into joining us, but if you become married and decide to leave, you'll be cut off from the church and everyone. Obviously, I said no thank you to this, I'm not interested in joining your group. They said that that's okay if I wanted to join, that they'll be around. My significant other told his co-worker who was Mormon about it and he said that yes, Mormons take 10% of your income to help with food banks and those in need but nothing like that and he insisted that it must be a cult. Now, I've seen cults on TV like the Heaven's Gate cults or the crazy ones that get busted by the feds but I never thought that I would come into contact with one in my life. Weirdly too, they were holding their hands together and very persistent the entire time. Just really creepy. What do you guys think though? Is this a cult? Should I be worried? Should I tell authorities? I really don't know what to do. I've experienced paranormal things since I was a child. I've always been open and receptive to paranormal things and maybe possibly to a fault even. You see, when I started dating my now husband, I would tell him all sorts of stories of things that I experienced through my childhood and even teenage years. He has always been fascinated by the paranormal and my stories always intrigued him, but he never experienced anything himself until we moved in together. I've always been convinced that I had a clinger spirit that has attached to me somewhere in my life and just stayed along for the ride pretty much. We've lived in different locations and always experienced the same things at each home. 
It was never anything malicious, and I always joked that my Casper was just doing things to say hi and let me know that he's here. My husband just laughed it off because there was never really an issue and everything seemed harmless and playful. I mean, we've walked into our offices with our desk chairs spinning when nobody was in the room. We have smart TVs and they all rotate turning on in the middle of the night as if someone is trying to watch TV, scrolling through the apps to select Netflix or Hulu. I've also seen it just run through different HDMI options. Items that have specific locations like keys will end up in random places like under the kitchen sink or in a sock drawer. But we shut our closet doors at night and we'll wake up with them wide open. Now, I can't sleep if there's even a sliver of light showing in my room. And pretty much any light will wake me up from a dead sleep. I wake up to the bathroom light switching on quite often, which requires me to get out of bed and turn it off so I can go back to sleep. My husband's computer powers on by itself too, and it's a bigger tower with a power button that takes a little effort to push. I guess you could say too that we've become used to those things. But lately, something else has started, and I think it's mimicking me. You see, lately when I'm downstairs and my husband is in his office upstairs, he'll walk to the landing of our stairwell and ask me if I just called his name. Usually if I need something or have a question for him, I'll just call his cell phone if I'm too lazy to run upstairs or if I'm in the middle of cooking and can't leave the stove or something. Even when I'm laying down in bed and he's on his computer in the same room, he'll pull off his headphones and ask me what I need. For a while I was thinking, am I losing my mind? Am I actually saying something and not realizing it? On some occasions too, he's even stopped gaming midstream to come and find me aggravated that I'm calling him when I literally haven't said a word. Every time I tell him that I didn't say his name and he gets this confused look like he's trying to read my face to see if I'm telling him the truth. But yesterday was definitely the turning point. I was laying in bed just reading and he threw a bottle of water on the bed next to me. I asked him why he brought me a bottle of water and he said, do you not remember asking me for water? told him no and pointed to a bottle of water on the nightstand that I brought to bed when I laid down and he said you literally just yelled down for me to bring you cold water. I explained to him that I didn't say that though because I had my cold water that I brought to bed with me. We both agreed that something really strange is happening here because this has just started within the last month and I don't know if this is my entity that has followed me just now becoming vocal or if this is something new. We're both of sound mind and neither of us have any sort of mental issues that we're aware of anyway that would have me speaking without knowing it or him hearing things. But aside from extreme annoyance, is there a real cause for concern? What do you guys think? When I was younger, I used to be obsessed with ghosts and all sorts of haunting shows too. And I'd never particularly had a reason to believe that my house was haunted, but one day my brother came home claiming to have found $10 just out of nowhere. I'll never know for sure if he was just messing with me, but after curiosity got the better of me, I asked him where he really got the $10 from. Stupid me assumed, maybe a friend. Perhaps he stole it from my parents' wallet? My parents never claimed to have been missing any money, however. Something they would definitely have voiced their distraught about if they had noticed that we'd been taking their cash. But the story he gave to me was that a young girl, about the age of seven, had followed him into the school bus that afternoon. He'd never met this girl and had never seen her around at school, but she decided to sit in the seat in front of him. After riding the bus for a little while, she started to talk to him. Nobody else could see her, according to him, though, and other kids were giving him looks. Eventually, she handed him $10 with a note, and then subsequently got off the bus at the next stop. I immediately assumed that he was lying and laughed, of course. I asked him to show me the note, which he promptly pulled out from his room and passed me a tiny piece of paper. And a shiver ran down my spine as the note wasn't in his handwriting, but... 
in the handwriting of what I could only assume to be a young child that read, I'll help you but only this time, which I believe was in response to the fact that my brother was begging my parents for a Zelda charm bracelet for months, which they refused to buy for him. But given that he had $10 now though, he could just buy it himself though. Of course, me being me was extremely intrigued by this, even if it did seem absurd. So I suggested that we make a makeshift Ouija board and see if we can contact anyone. So we wrote the alphabet on a piece of paper and grabbed a necklace to sort of hover above the DIY board. My brother was interested too, so he decided that it could be fun. Mind you, I was in 6th grade and he was in 4th at the time, so any sort of movement from the necklace caught our attention and we immediately thought that it was a ghost. After asking a few questions though, the necklace began to move and shake in a way that definitely wasn't us. Well, either my brother was really good at tricking me by slowly sliding the necklace across the board, or it was really something paranormal going on. But we were able to get a name though, Kate, after asking dumb things too, like, did you watch me complete the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time, and getting a yes, but me and my brother decided to stop for the night after being a bit creeped out, but we never actually said goodbye before ending though. Eventually, playing with the board would be a, a bit of a daily occurrence really, but we thought that we'd made a friend and truly believed that someone was talking to us. In fact, me and my brother decided to take things a step further and try to record something. So we got both of our tablets, placed them in front of our TV and hit record. And the first thing that I asked was, if someone's there, move something in the room. There was nothing. Okay, well maybe the ghost is shy, so we decided to ask the same question, but this time we said that we'll leave the room to give it time. We went downstairs for five minutes and when we got back upstairs, our tablets had both fallen to the floor and stopped recording. Maybe a coincidence? I mean, I mean, things fall, right? Especially when you're not careful about placing them, so we just sort of brushed that one off. But in December of the sixth grade, things got really weird. So I had started to hear voices in my head claiming that they were the ghost I was talking to while playing the Ouija board. I'd gotten so scared one night that I'd grabbed the Bible one of my religious friends had gifted me, I'm not religious by any means, and would sleep with it. Eventually I told my mum that there was a ghost telling me scary things. I won't go into detail as some of it was a little bit graphic, but she and my dad argued for a while about whether or not I was schizophrenic and if I should see a therapist. So out of fear I just decided that I would never tell them anything again. But I'd space out, often talking and having conversations with this thing I believed to be a ghost. Eventually though, I just sort of forgot about the ghost and we would no longer talk. I'll never know what that voice was, if I was genuinely insane, if they were just intrusive thoughts maybe, I don't know, but I was just glad for it to have stopped. Nothing necessarily paranormal has happened to me since besides my TV turning on randomly in the middle of the night or the feeling of someone sort of pushing my legs with some sort of unknown force every once in a while. I sum it up as just my imagination though playing tricks on me now these days. But I still do have this looming feeling that ever since I've played with that Ouija board I have some sort of thing attached to me following me. Not necessarily something bad or evil, but just a, a looming presence. So I was in the army and I was here for basic training. Every night we took turns doing fire guard. It's basically where two soldiers rotate every hour to watch the door and make sure everybody stays in bed. There were four barracks bays, ours, the female bay, was upstairs and across the hall from a male bay, but we used separate stairwells. So us females and the drill sergeants were the only ones using the center stairwell. The drill sergeants would come up to check on us periodically. The doors were heavy and pretty loud. We could clearly hear them when they went into the bay across the hall. So every now and then, we would hear footsteps come all the way up the stairs and stop. Neither of the doors would open and 
we would never hear them go back down. We even heard objects rolling down the stairs at some point. You could hear them hitting every individual step as they went down. And man, it was creepy. After lights out too, everyone had to stay in bed. And we had to let the fire guard know if we were going up to go to the bathroom and no showering was allowed after that time. There were times though when we would hear people talking in the bathroom in the middle of the night and sometimes hear the showers going too. So we would go to look because we all would get into trouble if anyone was up making noise. But there was never anybody in there. I should also mention too, the lights are motion sense. So we would walk in and the lights would turn on, meaning that a physical person hadn't been walking in there for at least a few minutes. Our beds were in rows all lined up, and one night we all got woken up by a scream right next to our row of beds. All of us sat up at the same time freaking out and looking at each other, but we couldn't figure out where it had come from. All of this happened in Fort Sill, but then there was Fort Pickett. So this was in 2009 during our annual summer training. We were in the field, which is basically like camping in tents. There was a large open field where the medical tent was and then our personal tents were sort of back in the tree line. And there were a few nights where people were woken up by something shaking their tents, whispering their names, or even some vivid nightmares. Some even saw figures standing outside of their tents. Some people had dreams where they woke up only to be in another dream. I was with another sergeant in a two-person tent far off to the edge of the group. When one night, I could have sworn that I heard footsteps all around our tent, almost circling it, as if a whole platoon was walking past us really slowly. But our medical area was so far away from all of the other training areas, and as far as I knew, no one was out training at 2am that day. Also, while this is not anything paranormal related, but the entire place was just infested with spiders like you wouldn't believe. But when we first got there, we went into the woods to set up our sleeping tents, and within five minutes there were like six spiders crawling on my pant legs. It definitely was not my favorite annual training, that's for sure. Anyway, Fort Indian Town Gap was the next one. My ex used to tell me while he was sleeping that he would always see a man or figures standing next to the bed or in the corners of the room. He often saw a man with a moustache, he would say, and I don't know who it could have been, but anyway, fast forward to another annual training. We had some free time one day and most of us decided to go back and take naps in the barracks. The girl in the bunk next to me was asleep for about an hour when she woke up and asked me if she had been screaming. I said, no, you didn't say anything the whole time. You were just sleeping. And she said that she just had a sleep paralysis and thought that she was awake. And in her awake dream, she was in the same barracks with all of us, but we were all staring at her. But the thing that got me was that she said that there was a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk. He was bent over and was the only person looking at me instead of her. Now, she's a complete skeptic, and I've never told her about what my ex saw too, so that definitely made my skin crawl. As a child, I had a few frightening experiences in the woods behind my childhood home. We lived there until I was 17, I'm 24 now, and a few weeks ago... I think I finally found a possible explanation for what happened. The house itself was also haunted, I think, but I'll save that for another time. Although, they are tied together, I think, but... Anyway, I spent a lot of time hiking and exploring, mostly alone while I was there. The location is rural southwestern Pennsylvania, on the border of West Virginia Panhandle, if anyone's interested. The forest behind our property was a few miles deep, I think, and in it was a small valley with a creek at the bottom. It was actually really pretty and had multiple waterfalls too. There was also a natural spring, a, a bog or swamp sort of thing, a huge section of bent trees covered in thick vines, and a cluster of mining equipment across the creek. The tree line was also about 60 yards from our back door. 
The large trail that went down into the valley was in the center of the tree line that bordered our yard, just beyond the start of the trees. There was also a smaller trail to the right that ran along the edge of our yard and branched off into a thick vine area. So, with that out of the way, let me get into some of the stories. So my first prominent memory was the day that I heard the voice. I was about 11 years old, I think, and it was late fall. The leaves had fallen and it was pretty cold, but it wasn't snowing yet. Weeds and brush were pretty thin. And there was a lot of visibility, in other words. And I had walked down the main trail for about 10 minutes to the bottom where the trail veered to the left. There was a small clearing at the bend where my dad would dump grass clippings and old straw bales. I frequently walked to this area. It was more like an extension of our yard, to be honest, but... I never felt afraid there, but this time, I don't know why, I just felt weird. A weird feeling washed over me, like I was being watched. I called out, hello? And immediately, a child's voice responded with hello back. It sounded so close that it was as if they were standing directly in front of me. I stood there in disbelief for a moment, but eventually started looking around. The leaves were on the ground and crunchy, so I would have heard footsteps for sure. But there were absolutely none anywhere. None of the homes around us had small children too, and I even checked the trees for tree stands, but there was nothing. It didn't terrify me, but I definitely didn't want to stay down there for sure, so I decided to go back up to our house. I must have been about halfway up the trail too when... I felt two taps on my left shoulder. I whipped around expecting to catch my brothers messing with me, but when I did, nobody was there. And again, I didn't hear any footsteps. I didn't see anything. I started walking again and felt the same two taps about 30 seconds later. And that was it for me. I ran as fast as I could until I got home. That was the first time that I heard the child's voice and as the years went on I began hearing it inside the house as well but that's a different story and it was really freaky. So the second story I have was I was born in 96 so we had internet access growing up but it wasn't like we have today. We also didn't have cell phones yet but that being said I never thought to look up our house on Google Maps until after we moved. Earlier I mentioned how the woods were a few miles deep but for most of my life I assumed that there was another house or a road up on the other side of the valley. We often heard the sounds of people talking and also some children playing off in the distance. Nothing creepy, it just sounded like we were getting close to perhaps another property and people were outside or something. Almost like an echo. Our parents always told us that we owned the land down to the creek so we rarely explored to the other side but... I did try on one occasion. I was older this time, probably about 14 I think. I had hiked down to the creek and was now following it upstream to the east. When I came across a large trail going up onto the side that we didn't own. I decided that I wanted to finally see who lived up there so I walked for about 5 minutes. And then I began smelling something just horribly rotten. I was gagging and had to hold my nose at one point and about 20 feet in front of me was a dead deer sitting just off the trail to the left. I convinced myself to walk past it and the smell settled so I continued down the trail a bit. The trail flattened out and turned to the right. It seemed like it was getting darker too but it was still early afternoon so that was weird. The trees seemed thicker and closer now too like the trail was narrow. I walked for about 30 yards when I came across a, a dead rabbit sitting directly in the middle of the trail at my feet. And that was when it hit me. Something was wrong. My flight or fight response kicked in and a wave of fear suddenly hit me. The trail was also really dark now and I swear that I could see the trees moving inward toward me like a tunnel vision. Up until this point too I heard the voices of people but... Now, all of a sudden, it was completely silent. Like, there was nothing, not even insects. I turned around quickly and I bolted down the trail. The feeling of fear went away once I finally crossed back to our side. Now, I guess it could have been a bear or a coyote or something. 
We do have natural defense instincts if we don't see it, but another thing to note is that the deer and the rabbit, they weren't eaten or bloody. They were just dead. After we moved though, I went on Google Maps, satellite view to show someone at my new school where I used to live, and I zoomed out and that's when I realized that there was nothing behind the house but trees. There was never another house back there, and there was never any other people that should have been there at least. So the question is, where was that noise coming from and who were those people? The third story I have was, there was a small field between us and our neighbors to the right. Their yard dipped into a hill right before the tree line, and that section wasn't mowed frequently because of the hill and was often just sort of tall grass. We were outside with the neighbor girl at one point, she was a few years older than me, when we found a sort of bronze owl figurine sitting in the tall grass. It wasn't buried, it was on top of the grass. We took it to her mum, thinking that it was hers, but she said that it wasn't. When we asked my parents, and it wasn't theirs either, we even asked the neighbors on the other side, and it wasn't theirs. It was too far from the road to have fallen from a car or be thrown out like litter or something. And I mean, who is really out there littering with bronze anyway? So I just took it home. I kept it in my room for a while, but it began to really creep me out. Our house is already haunted, like I mentioned at the beginning, but things seemed more frequent since bringing this thing in. I didn't want to throw it away though, I didn't want to disrespect it like that, so I took it into the woods by myself and left it on a stump far from the trail. I don't even remember where the stump was to be honest, but I felt better with it out of the house, that was for sure. The next spring my dad was tilling and plowing and getting ready to plant the corn for the year, and to my absolute amazement, he, he dug it up out of the ground. That same owl figurine with the same marking underneath. There was a black marking on the bottom as if it had sat on top of something for a long time. And I couldn't believe it. He tilled every year. And there was just no way another one was in there that whole time. We couldn't explain it, but we just sort of kept it in the end. In fact, it sat on our kitchen window until the day that we moved. And then it came with us. My mum actually threw it out a few weeks ago. I didn't know until she did, but I still have a picture of it, and maybe I'll share it with you guys sometime. And I know it doesn't prove anything, but you can even still see the dirt in the little crevices from where it was buried. That one was a weird one, and something I still don't have an explanation for. My dad still talks from time to time about it too, because even he thought it was a bit weird. There were other smaller things too about the woods that weren't exactly necessarily paranormal, but definitely odd. Like, there were one set of vines that came down into a circle with an opening like a doorway. Think of the shape of like a teepee. I didn't like going into that area with the bent trees alone. Some had 90 degree bends in them and were sort of covered in thick vines. It felt like a whole different forest in there too. My brothers and I used to say that there were witches in that part or pretend that it was cursed. Playtime can get a bit weird when you grow up in a haunted house, let me tell you. I only ever saw the mining equipment once too. I never found it again. Sometimes I would wonder if it was really there, but my brothers were with me that time and they saw it too. There was a mine cart, some track, and even a large machine. I never saw a mine entrance, but my brother swears to this day that he found one once. The natural spring could have affected the level of activity, I know, but I think that that's a, a theory in the paranormal world at least. The swamp was really random, it wasn't at the bottom of the valley near the creek either. The hillside just sort of flattened out and it was sort of like a bog. Picture sort of thick vertical weeds and cattails taller than you are. The center was cleared out in a sort of circle shape and I actually walked through it once. It was only a foot deep, although... I'm glad I only went in at once because there could have been an opening or a deep spot for sure. I was foolish to assume that I could walk in it, but anyway, it's what I did. To the left of the main trail, about, I would say, 10 yards into the tree line, there was also a large gaping hole that was partially filled in with cement blocks and bricks. And one day when I was young, I distinctly remember speaking in gibberish as I was hiking alone. 
I can't remember why I did that. I just started doing it. And it really sounded like another language, which is weird. Anyway, even as an adult and someone who hasn't lived there for like seven years now, I still have reoccurring nightmares about those woods. Not so much the house, but definitely the woods. A month or two ago, I even had a vivid dream and decided that I needed answers. I'm from a small town and a lot of people have family from the original settlers. So I posted on Facebook asking if anyone knew or had family that knew the history of this area. And as luck would have it, one of the guys that I went to school with, he messaged me. He explained how his grandparents were original to the village. And he said that there was an entire mining town up the road from us that's no longer there. Only a few houses remain, but the mines, however, extended down the road to the area where our house now stands. He has pictures and maps of it, in fact, and he asked what our address was and asked a family friend of ours for more info. This man said that the main portal to one of the mines, it was directly behind our house, which could explain the gaping filled-in hole just behind the tree line. I asked him if there were any incidences or death in the mines, and he said that there were many accidents, but he didn't know the specifics. Then, before I could even ask, he said, and I still get chills just thinking about this, that eight-year-old boys and even younger kids worked in the mines too. He sent me a photo of his grandfather with some other miners, and there were two young boys in the picture, and... Well, I have to ask myself, what if a child died and that was who I was hearing? He's also a local firefighter and said that they still get calls from people falling through the air shafts into the mine sometimes. He said that the EPA finally came in after we moved close to some of the portals. There's a town heritage center in one of the still standing mine houses, but before that opened, people still lived there. One day the kids climbed under the house while playing and found human remains apparently and after an investigation they determined that it was from the clan initiations back in the day. It seemed like it was kept quiet and he said the entire area is known for being haunted. The dark history of the place apparently goes all the way back to the battles with the Native Americans when it was first settled. Other firemen and his parents have seen things too and it's just a a really, really old and active place. As far as we know, there were no deaths in our house. I always wondered if it was from the land, not the building, and I guess that all of this, it solidified my theory. I really can't believe that I waited this long to reach out to people in the community like this. It's just uh, such a relief knowing that I'm not alone and there could be a reason for all of this. My brother, my fiancé and I have also decided to go back into the woods sometime in the next few weeks to see if we can find anything again or feel anything. I don't know. Maybe I need closure or maybe I'm still not done with this, but either way, wish me luck. I should preface this by saying that this happened to my girlfriend, now wife, and also me too around 2005 at our first apartment which was a really old building built around the 1920s and prior to this incident we had already experienced several strange and frightening things but this was definitely on another level. So when moving there we noticed one of the bedrooms would get extremely cold even in mid-July we live in West Texas, mind you. Also, my girlfriend had a couple of angel statues that her mum gifted her, and whenever we would get home from work, they would be facing the corner wall. Almost as if, like, someone didn't want to look at them, so they would turn them. One time, too, my girlfriend left for work early morning, and I was still in bed just watching TV, and I swear that I heard the front door open and close. I figured that she'd forgotten something, so I called out her name, and there was no response. I turned my head towards the bedroom door, and saw a strange face peek out the corner and hide. It honestly scared the life out of me, and I ran to the living room, but there was nobody there. But the scariest thing to ever happen to us, and ultimately was the deciding factor in us moving, happened one night around 10pm. 
My girlfriend and I were just at home listening to some music, having a couple of beers. This was like pre-YouTube era, so we were listening to CDs on my Xbox when we heard a knock on the door. We were wondering who would have been knocking so late, but my girlfriend noticed that it was a little old lady through the peephole. We opened up and this old Mexican lady in really old-fashioned clothes asked us in Spanish, Is Crystal here? She's my daughter. My girlfriend and I are both bilingual, so we understood her, but what freaked us out was my girlfriend's name is Crystal too. My girlfriend is bugging out and tells her, My name is Crystal, but I don't know you. The old lady gets visibly upset by this and says, No, I've been waiting a very long time and I know she lives here. Tell me where she is now. And she's tearing up as she says this. I tell her, Lady, there's no crystal here for you. And at that, I just shut the door. My girlfriend gets upset at this and says, Maybe she needs our help. And I swear on all that is holy and on a stack of Bibles that the door, it must have been shut for no more than 10 seconds max when my girlfriend opened it. And the lady, she was gone. Our front door has a wide walkway too that you can see some walking up from quite a distance and there was just no way that a little old lady in her shape, that frail, could have ran off or gotten out of sight that quickly. And man, were we bugging the heck out. I swear to this day too that I'll never forget that old lady crying in Spanish just looking for her daughter Crystal and just how desperate her voice was. We moved only a week after that, but it's a memory that is definitely going to stay with me. So I, a female, was 18 at the time that this happened and going to apply to get my driver's license. I wanted to go to a centre a bit out of town so it would be a bit quieter and decided on a place that was a walk and two different train routes away. I could have probably asked my dad for a cab fare, but I don't like asking for things, so I just went myself. I had checked on Google Maps beforehand, and it seemed really close to where the train stop was. But once I got out, all I saw was a giant road and the area was very industrial. The area was a lot dodgier too than I think I expected, and I didn't want to be on my phone. So I decided to go up to a small group of women selling fruit since they should know the area well enough and they seemed like a safe option to ask for directions. When I got there at the stall there was a man and he said I actually work there and am on my way and will show you. I felt a bit nervous I must admit but he seemed confident and friendly. He walked me out of the station and down the road telling me a long story about how he was late for work and he was going to get in so much trouble about being late before, etc, etc. His story was getting more and more detailed and he started to seem, I don't know, nervous and was just talking a bit too much. Once we had been walking down the road a little, I sort of realized though that we were walking in the wrong direction. So I asked him... Where is it from here? And he pointed way ahead of us to a warehouse. Now, I knew that the center was definitely not that far away, so I just initially nervously, with him saying again and again, it's not far from here, and then eventually assertively, I said, I want to be safe, and thank you, but I'll just take a cab. So I ducked into the closest business, a vet, and called a cab. And when it came, it actually took me in the opposite direction, which was weird. This was definitely really creepy, and I have no idea what his plan was once we got to that warehouse, but I'm pretty confident that nothing good would have come from it. In fact, looking back on this, it's kind of terrifying. I didn't go back to the center again after that, and... I haven't been back to that place for years. So this happened to me two weeks ago. I started university in September and therefore I live in a students only apartment complex. 
There are four other apartments in my hallway and sometimes we just spend time in each other's apartments. I had the luck too to lose my keys the first week of university. It wasn't a big deal, I simply paid for another set of keys. But after a week in my apartment, I started to notice that some of my stuff wasn't in the same place as I thought I'd put it. It didn't really scare me because, well, I'm a pretty easily distracted person. But on the day of the incident, I was coming home earlier than usual with another student, Thomas, the boy that lives in the apartment next to mine. Well, we went in and when I unlocked my door, there was a woman inside my apartment. Of course, it really scared me, but as I was about to ask her what the heck she was doing in here, she told me, Oh, sorry, I didn't know that you'd be home this early. I'm the janitor. I clean rooms weekly. She then smiled at me and she left. I didn't even know that we had a janitor in this complex, but I guess this kind of explained why my stuff was moving. Thomas then noticed that she had left her keys on my desk and said that I should give them back to her. And when I looked closer, I realized that those were my lost keys. Oh, the night passed and I decided to talk to the man in charge of the complex about this. I told him that the janitor had my lost keys, so I didn't really lose them, and I asked for my money back. But he just looked at me in sort of total incomprehension and told me, but we don't even have a janitor. And at that, I just froze. Because the obvious question is, who the heck went in my apartment for the past few weeks why was she there and what was she doing? We decided not to call the police because, well, nothing had actually been stolen, but I still searched for cameras in my apartment. You never know with these sort of psychopaths, but I haven't seen her since that day. And I'm really glad to know that she can't enter the complex anymore without the badge on the keys. And I guess the moral of the story is try not to lose your keys, guys, because... You just never know where they may end up. So, this happened a year ago and I'm still pretty shaken by this whole event. So I thought that I would tell my story. I live in the UK and in autumn it gets dark at around 4pm. There was a school autumn break that week so all the kids were at home and that means that my girlfriend's brother was home too. I'd been with her for a year at that point, so her family knew me pretty well and her brother enjoyed my company. She'd recently been pretty stressed out though because her parents were going across the country or something for the day, so she had to look after her brother, but I thought that I'd give her a day to herself so she can just cool off. I asked her parents if I could take care of their son for the day instead, and they agreed. So I came around at about 8 in the morning and they let me in before they set off. My girlfriend's brother woke up about an hour later I think and she followed shortly afterwards. We went out for breakfast at a local cafe together and went back to her house when we were done. And once I dropped her off I took her brother to the park. We got there at about 2pm and the place was pretty packed. Eventually the sun started going down and the place was completely empty by 4 o'clock. I texted my girlfriend and told her that we'd be home in a bit. She said okay. I'm going to be honest though, I completely lost track of time. Me and her brother were just having so much fun being the only two in the park that we just forgot. Me and her brother were stood on the top of this really tall climbing frame with a slide on it. It was almost pitch black at this point so I was using my phone as a flashlight. A notification popped up on my phone screen and it was my girlfriend asking where we were. I responded, oops, coming home now, and told her brother that we had to go. He sighed and asked if we could go down the slide, and I said yes, why not? Before I went down though, I knew what the park looked like. There were street lights all around it, benches everywhere, some trees, and places for the kids to play. When I came out of the slide, there was something weird though. A man had appeared out of nowhere and was stood beneath one of the street lights. He had a trench coat on and a beanie hat and I immediately got my girlfriend's brother behind me and called out to the man with a friendly hi there and I got a response. He started groaning. 
I noticed that he was swaying back and forth in the light and he had his mouth open, drooling, with a sort of blank look in his eyes. And this man, he made me feel really uneasy instantly. I picked the little bro up and I kept checking on this guy the entire time. There was an exit on my left that led to the path back home so I left out that way and kept checking behind me every few seconds. The guy was still stood there. The path where the guy was stood emerges with a big main path if you walk out through some bushes and so does the one that I walked through. I was walking down the path for about maybe two minutes I would guess periodically checking behind me of course and thought that I was in the clear but I wasn't. I was on a straight stretch of path with lots of street lights when I saw him again. He was stood beneath one looking up at it and he was playing with something in his hands. I looked closer and realized that it was a knife. I kept walking and walking checking behind me constantly girlfriend's little brother was so scared that he had his head tucked into my chest. I noticed that the guy seemed to be moving to new street lights whenever I turned around. Initially I thought it was my eyes playing tricks on me to be honest but I started counting them and realized two street lights behind him had definitely turned into five. I could faintly hear the groaning noise still and he was occasionally moaning as well. I picked up the pace a bit and I turned a corner getting into the last stretch of the street before I got to my girlfriend's house. And that was when I heard him behind the row of bushes. That moaning noise sounded angry now, and I heard his heavy footsteps bounding down the path quickly, which meant that this guy was running. I immediately broke into a sprint, and I didn't stop until I turned into the alleyway at the front of the street and got behind my girlfriend's house. There's a big bush there, so I crouched down behind that and spammed her phone with messages to open the back gate. I hugged her brother close until she opened it for us and got us in quickly. But man, did it feel like years that we were out there. I went to the front of the house and had it confirmed that I'd managed to shake him. He was now in the street circling where I had been, outside of the alleyway just moments ago. And yes, he was still moaning. He had that knife in his hand still and he started kicking people's bins over in anger I think. I called the police immediately, but he was gone by the time that they arrived, and as far as I know, they never found him too. Strangely though, there was a similar incident near the area a few months ago. I saw it in a local Facebook group, but I don't think anything came of that one either. In the end though, her parents thanked me for keeping their son safe and didn't hold any ill will against me for the situation. He went back to normal pretty much the day afterwards, which was good, but... He still has nightmares about the event. And when my country isn't in lockdown again, I'm still allowed to look after him with my girlfriend. Funnily enough, I suppose. But we haven't been to that park ever since, and I still check over my shoulder and break into a cold sweat every time that I'm alone in the street these days. For context, I'm currently 22 years old and it happened back in December of 2008 or maybe January of 2009 but I was around 10 at the time. I live in Estonia which is in the northern part of Europe. This is important too since during the heart of winter we have only about like 4 hours of daylight and it's fairly dark from around 3pm until at least 11am. So, the story takes place in a resort roughly 80 kilometers east from the capital, Taylin, where I had gone on a trip with my school class. Everyone was super excited since it was our first trip where we also spent the night. A rather popular thing to do back in that day was to make these sort of makeshift Ouija boards on paper and use a ring on a string above it that would swing lightly pointing towards certain letters or numbers for answers. Nobody ever really took it seriously, mind you, and mostly it was considered this kind of prank that older kids played on younger ones. We called it calling out the spirits at the time. So obviously though, as kids, we do not think twice before doing it, and we thought it was fun. Roughly 10 of us gathered around, make the makeshift board and the ring on the string thing, and mostly just goofed around with it, asking very cliche and dumb questions like, did you die in this house? Are you going to haunt us tonight? If yes, reveal yourself somehow, etc. But nothing happened throughout these sessions as far as I remember. 
perhaps some more sensitive kids got a bit creeped out by it and maybe they left and the others accused the one holding the ring on a string of pointing to certain things on purpose but well who knows what really happened and that's not what this story is about anyway so it had to be around maybe 8 or 9 p.m and teachers were encouraging us to get to bed since some of our classmates had gotten caught imitating smoking by rolling a tube out of newspaper and lighting it on fire and smoking it it was already pitch black darkness outside so it was pretty much time for bed anyway i was sharing my room with another guy from my class his name was mike the layout of the room was two beds parallel to each other with about a one meter gap between them one was closer to the corridor door where I was sleeping and the other was closer to the opposite wall that was almost entirely covered by the glass balcony sort of door thing. Basically a huge window and that was where Mike was sleeping. So we were both sitting on the edges of our beds with the big light turned on getting undressed and getting ready to get into our beds. But Mike was sitting facing my bed and the corridor door and I was sitting facing his bed and the huge window. So I stood up to take off my shirt when I saw it behind the glass balcony door. At first my brain didn't quite register what it was since the light was on in the room and I thought it was just my reflection or something until it moved a couple of steps to the left and started turning around. All of this happened while I was standing in place and Mike was sitting on the bed but I completely froze for what felt like a long time. And man, to this day, this is still the scariest moment of my life, 100%. Because it was like a light golden, sort of light peach colored human sized thing was just standing there. As soon as my brain registered, this is not your reflection, I sort of made a bit of a gasp like sound and flung myself to the bed and covered my head with the pillow without saying a word. I must have gone completely pale too since Mike started asking me what's wrong, what's there. Me with my head still on the pillow asked is it still there and he asked is what's still there. I'm not looking before you tell me what's there. So little by little I turned my head up towards the window side of the wall convincing myself that I'm just seeing things and this can't be real and I have to look again. But boy was I majorly wrong. I turned my head back. I immediately turned it back inside the pillow and cold shivers ran through my entire body because what I saw was the same light, golden light, peach colored shape standing behind that glass door. It had no distinguishable neck or arms or legs but it roughly resembled a sort of humanoid silhouette with two black eyes. I kept my head in the pillow for what felt like a long time again but most likely it was probably a couple of minutes. And when I turned my head back next time, it was gone and we went on with our evening by talking about random stuff as kids do until I fell asleep. To this day, I still don't know what it was or what it could have been. But I had the idea of sharing it here now since my friend sent me a huge collection of true scary experiences from other places on the internet and I thought that I should share mine. I know it's a bit of a weird one and... I don't really have any answers, I have no idea what it was, but there was definitely something or someone there and there's no way they could have jumped down from the balcony because it was way too high, you would die for sure. Plus, it's not like it was adult size or anything, it was small and whatever it was, it definitely had completely black eyes. Anyway... Feel free to ask for any additional details and I'll try my best to provide them in the comments below but it was 12 years ago and my memory of the rest of the trip is pretty foggy so I don't know how much I will remember. But if you got this far then thanks for listening. This is something that happened when I was younger and it's always just stuck with me. I must have been around eight and my sister must have been around six I think. My mum would take us to our grandpa's house, her side, very often. Her mother, my grandma, she passed away when my mum was only like nine or ten years old in that house. And there was this one time that I remember sitting in the living room with my mum, sister, brother and grandpa. My mum and grandpa were chatting while us kids were playing. 
I had to go to the bathroom really bad, but for some reason was afraid to go alone. I asked my mum to take me, but since she was talking to my grandpa, she told me to ask my sister. My sister didn't want to go with me, even though I begged and begged. And in the end, I finally decided to just go it alone. Now, the bathroom was a decent size. You would walk in and you would pass a huge sink countertop with a mirror covering the wall and then the toilet and the tub would be at the end. I remember walking in and I can't remember if I closed the door or not, but I probably did, I think. In any case, as I walked in, I sort of gave a side glance to the wide mirror and I saw my sister walking behind me, smiling. I turned around to yell at her for making me beg so much and saying no to just come after all, but when I turned around, she wasn't there. The bathroom was completely empty. It was so long ago and I was so little, but I think I even remember hearing her voice. I couldn't tell you for the life of me what she might have said though, but I think she did say something. Either way, I quickly ran back to the living room to tell my mum what happened and ask my sister if she had followed me after all. And my sister swears, even to this day when I bring it up, that she never followed me into that bathroom. My grandpa doesn't live there anymore and I don't know if my mum ever believed me, although she does believe in the paranormal, so who knows. But I really don't think that my sister did follow me. But if she didn't, then who or what did I see? This happened to me when I was about 12 or 13 years old or so, about 15 years ago, and also, I'm a female. So the town that I lived in has developed a lot since this story, but when this happened, there were a lot of factories spread out with lots of land in between them. There was a Walmart being built in the area, but it had barely started construction at the time. There was a main highway that ran through there, but my mum didn't like taking it as much as traffic would get pretty bad most of the time there. The side streets you would take were desolate and not much light. There was also little to no cars taking these streets, but I can't remember where we were coming from that night. In the car that night, though, was my mum, my brother, who was three years younger than me, and me. My mum is obviously driving, I'm in the passenger seat, and my brother is sitting behind me. My mum is the sweetest person ever, but is very adamant that she will never stop to help somebody on the side of the road or pick somebody up, especially when her kids are in the car. She does, however, make sure that she calls the police so they can help them. Anyway, it was around 9pm and we were going home when my mum and I spot someone on the side of the road by the passenger side with their hood up. But nothing out of the ordinary as my mum slows down a little since it's dark outside and doesn't want to harm anybody that might be fixing their car and accidentally step out or something. As soon as we're close to the car though, this guy steps out from around the hood of the car towards the street and is waving us down. I don't really remember much of the description because I wasn't paying too much attention at the time, plus I can barely see this guy, but I do remember feeling bad that we weren't at least going to stop to see what he needed. The man at this point is in the middle of the road waving his hands, but as we come up on the car, we don't see anybody else in the car. So my mum swerves around him and tells my brother to find her phone in a purse that was in the floor between the front and the back seats. I look at my mum as she looks in the rearview mirror, and her face goes completely white, and her eyes get really wide. My mum quickly slams her foot on the accelerator, this is highly unusual for my mum, of course, as she's really good at going the speed limit. But at this point, I knew that something was very wrong. My mum's voice goes high, and in a panic, she's asking my brother where her phone is. I'm yelling at her, what's going on? All this chaos is freaking my brother out, and with him being so little, he's now crying and can't find the phone. My mum keeps her eye on the road, but keeps glancing up continuously at her rearview mirror, and finally answers... He's following us. I'm not exactly sure what she was talking about, but know that this is not a good situation. My mum is speeding towards the highway, and thank goodness there's no traffic. I look out the back window and see somebody passing cars trying to keep up with my mum. I ask her where she's going, and she told me that she's heading to the police station. 
as we're getting close, my mum tells me to jump out of the car as soon as she stops the car, grab my brother from the back seat while she runs around to the car to meet us. My mum stops right in front of the police station and doesn't even wait for the car to fully come to a stop before she puts the car in park. I open my car door as fast as I can and grab my brother, who has quickly opened his door. I take off in a full sprint with my brother in one hand and my mum on the other hand. And once we finally talk to a police officer is when I finally understand the full extent of what happened. My mum told the police officer that once we had passed this guy with a broke down car, he quickly ran to the hood of his car and slammed it. He then got into his car and sped after us. And that was when my mum knew that this guy was up to something horrible. She said that he kept trying to speed up to get onto the side of us, but she was able to speed up to avoid that. Once my mum turned toward the police station, she said the guy had stopped following her, but Still wanted to get to the police station, just in case he changed his mind. She gave the best description of the guy in his car that she could, but because everything happened so quickly and it was pretty dark, she didn't get a license plate number or anything. I'm pretty sure that the police never found this guy, and I'm also not sure what the guy had planned for us if we had actually stopped to help him, but I know that it was definitely nothing good. Anyway, all I can say is... Thank God for my mum. I've sort of debated sharing this because, well, I know it sounds crazy, but it did actually happen and my ex experienced it as well. In fact, we still bring it up from time to time when we see each other. So, I used to live on the EBCI reservation in the Smoky Mountains. There's a spot called Thomas Divide and it's been known for decades to have sort of unexplained floating orbs and all sorts of weird things. You're supposed to pull off at the lookout, flash your lights three times at the mountains and just wait there. It's a known phenomena that's even been written about but one night my ex and I decided to go and check it out. We drive up to the pull off at night, park on the left part of the clearing, turn off the vehicle, flash our lights three times at the mountains below and then we wait. It's dark out, but the pull-off has basically a gravel clearing surrounded by woods, and the moon was full, so you could see the whole area pretty well. We could both see the entire area around the car, and there was nobody else there. We both had our windows rolled down. Most of the pull-off area that we're in is to the right, since we pulled in more to the left, and we're facing toward the mountains now. We were just talking, having a nice time, and... My ex flashes his lights three times again since nothing had happened yet. I have my arm hanging out my window and I'm just looking up at the stars and I've sort of loudly announced that this is stupid and that nothing is happening. And well, immediately after my announcement, we start hearing the sound of footsteps at the end of the clearing, heading in our direction, toward my side of the car. They were coming fast but sounded light and quick like... They belonged to a, a small person, so maybe like a child running? I am skeptical at first and figured that there must be an explanation. It's quite bright from the moon, so I can see everything, but I'm just not seeing anything running in my direction. Although I can clearly hear the gravel crunching and the sound of footsteps. I start hanging out my window, straining to see what could be heading in our direction, because obviously there must be an explanation, and... I want to see what's coming towards us. The footsteps eventually come right up to my door too and then something physically hits my door. Mind you, I'm actually hanging out my window at this point, looking at my door and the ground next to it and I never saw a thing. However, whatever invisible thing that ran up to us to hit my door with enough force that it made a banging sound, like someone had punched it and the car rocked slightly, you could see and hear the impact, but couldn't see what made it. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear to you that this is exactly what happened. My ex's eyes got big and asked if it was me that did that. He thought that I was playing with him, though he had heard the footsteps and knew that those had nothing to do with me. And I told him no, that I didn't do that. And at that, he reversed his car as fast as possible and sped out of there and back home as quickly as he could. He was looking all around outside as well as once we heard the footsteps, but 
He never saw a thing too, or what was making the footsteps either. He could only hear them like I could. This is one of the most unnerving things that has ever happened to me. It was the 4th of July and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth an aim and flame cigarette lighter and lighting firecrackers and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning, 5th of July. I left to get something to drink and I left my brother there lighting fireworks. I get back around 10 minutes later and he's asking me for the lighter and I told him that I didn't have it. I left it with him and he was actively lighting firecrackers as I left. He says, yeah, I know, but I just gave it to you a couple of minutes ago. Where is it? Now, I know my brother and this just isn't something that he would lie about. We've talked about it many times over the years too and the story has never changed. The moon was bright that night, bright enough to see, and he says that he saw me in my same outfit, same face, same hair, and everything. Apparently, I said nothing, went up, and put my hand out. My brother assumed it was because I wanted the lighter. He gave the lighter, and whatever it was, apparently just walked away and never said a word. These were woods privately owned by my family, by the way, far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there, and if they were... That doesn't explain how they looked exactly like me. We continued setting off fireworks till around 4 in the morning, having to use a short cigarette lighter because whatever it was, it stole the aim and flame. We never did get it back too, and the whole thing is just really creepy. I was out walking in the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning one day. I believe it was around 1 or 2 in the morning. And last year I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of the highway and a tunnel underneath the highway connected the two sides of the camp so the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend, they liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this was pretty terrifying because well, we were startled by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easy, but we soon learned to identify the sound of the fox and we actually saw it several times. Now one night it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods and as we ran at a corner in the trail I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel and sort of grey shapes there. I assumed that they were deer and pointed them out to her, but we continued our walk past the tunnel but... Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching that we've ever heard. It sounded as if someone was being strangled, in fact. It didn't sound at all like a fox, but in the end we just sort of walked away quickly and shrugged it off. We continued up the road when all of a sudden I had a weird feeling and turned about to see a tall figure standing in the road. It seemed to be dressed in all white and was all sort of hazy-like. I honestly wondered if I was just a little too tired and was seeing things at first, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. But she immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted though was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. We couldn't sort of keep our vision centered on it, which was really strange, but I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but somehow I just knew that it wasn't going to do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go now. We backed away and then started running. We didn't stop until we were back to the cabins, but when I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what we had seen, and he looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. After that, I just never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a bit of a nervous feeling, to be honest. Now, we had no drugs or alcohol, and we were both under 21 with no mental health issues, and we were working at a church camp with strict policies, so I have no idea what it was, but to be honest, I don't know if I want to find out.
Nein, nein. This was many years ago now, in a time when there was still magic in my life. The Easter Bunny still left a basket for me every year, Santa delivered presents, and the Tooth Fairy would leave money under my pillow when I lost a tooth. I could not have been more than eight years old, I suppose, but I'm almost positive that I remember being younger, possibly as young as maybe six or seven years old even. At the time, I had a bunk bed that I shared with my younger sister. I am the older sister, so of course I wanted the top bunk, which was rightfully given to me. Now that I'm an adult, I know that it's probably because my sister was only three years old when we got it, and my parents likely feared that she would fall in the night. If I was six or seven at the time of the event, she would have been four or five at that point. Either way though, I had the top bunk and she had the bottom. We were both very young at the time, obviously, and my parents kept a lamp in the room at night for us. My mum would always say that she would leave a light on so that we could see if we had to get up to use the bathroom and stuff. I do not remember when we stopped using the lamp in the room, though. I think that my parents just wanted to save some money on electricity. I think I prefer there to be a source of light if my eyes are going to be open. I remember very vividly the light from the lamp on the shelf from the back of the room, too. And that's the first thing that I noticed when I opened my eyes. I just remember that one minute I was asleep and the next thing I knew, I was aware. The light was on across the room on the shelf. I was just sort of slowly taking in my surroundings. In retrospect, I think it was my instincts. I guess we just don't understand them or question them as much when we're young like that. But we just do or act and suffer the consequences later. The number of, why did you do that, I don't know, interactions, uh, too many to count sometimes, right? Anyway, I think now that I had felt something watching me and it had woken me from somewhere in my dreams. And the fact that I didn't notice it standing there first is honestly phenomenal. It's weird writing it out like this too because I've never had to think too hard about the details. But the first thing I noticed though, as I said was the other side of the room where the lamp was. I always slept with my face pressed up against the bars of the safety rails on the upper bed, so seeing out wasn't an issue. Maybe my face wasn't pressed right up against the bars right then. I don't remember if I sat up a bit too to look around or what, but I just remember suddenly being awake, being aware. I was awake, seeing the room, my light, and then I noticed, standing right at face level with me, was someone or perhaps something. I really don't know what it was still. I, I only looked at it long enough to register and it scared me. It appeared to be like a, a smiley face I think. I can't express to you how creepy that is though. It didn't have human proportions in its face that's for sure. I registered two eyes but didn't see if they had pupils or what color they truly were. My memory tells me that they were completely black, like my smiley face. I didn't recognize a nose. I would describe it like maybe the nose of Voldemort, except I don't even remember there being nostrils. Perhaps a sort of bump, just a slight raise where a nose should be. But the smile, I think, is what really freaks me out. It was disproportionately very long for the face, and I don't think I remember it showing teeth, but... It was staring me dead in my eyes, looking right into me and acknowledging that I was seeing it. As I mentioned earlier, this was a time that magic was still alive in my life. A time where the first thing I would do when my child brain recognizes and registers something right in front of me as a threat is hide under my blankets. I didn't scream, I barely even breathed. And I think that's what made me know that it really happened because anyone would and could easily have written it off as just a dream or a trick of the eyes or something. But no, my heart was pounding under there. I'm not sure why I thought hiding would help, but I had looked at dead in its creepy eyes, seen its dreadful smile, and it would have known well that I knew that it was there. Little kid logic, I guess, but I felt like I had been hiding under the blankets for what must have been 10 minutes, 
I stayed under there until my own carbon dioxide had overaccumulated and I could barely breathe right. I sort of peeked out again and when I did, it was gone. Now, I only got a good look at it for maybe one or two seconds. I didn't see a body, so I don't know if it was humanoid in that respect or what. But because of the height of where my bunk bed is at, I would say the face was standing at about five foot tall. Again though, I didn't see any teeth, couldn't tell anything except maybe voids for eyes, didn't see any hands, it didn't touch me, not while I was awake anyway. But I was so young at the time, the fear was too easily overriding curiosity. I was horrified when I saw it, of course. It's not like I saw a stranger and they told me to go back to sleep or something. But I definitely saw something. And to this day, I honestly have no idea what it was. It was just a, a really, really creepy smiling face that I so lovingly dubbed the Smiley Face Man. I never mentioned it to my parents, and I never asked my sister if she ever felt or saw anything too. I'm not even sure why I kept it to myself for so long, if I'm being honest. Maybe I thought it would never make a difference even if I mentioned it. I don't know. I would also like to add that my family has always kept safeties and boundaries on the house, so I honestly don't think that it was evil. I think that it was scary but just maybe not malicious. I really don't believe it could have entered the house otherwise, so I don't believe that it had ill will or intention of harm. It doesn't make it any easier to get past, believe me, but it woke me up and was right in front of my eyes. It was gone when I came out of hiding, and I've never seen it since. It was just a one-time thing, I suppose. Anyway, this is uh, basically me just reaching out. I don't know what I saw, and if anyone has any real answers, I would be elated to at least humor them for research purposes if it's not what I'm looking for. I want to know of anyone who has had at least a similar experience. I don't know if it was an entity or a spirit or some kind of being, or if maybe I just had seven-year-old sleep brain that constructed a literal child's nightmare with the lights on, mind you. If any of you guys could help me out here, then that would be much appreciated.